Hello everybody, James here, WSI my guest this week, one of the strongest and most imposing figures in the history of professional wrestling. It is of course the Warlord. Good morning to you. Good morning, it's early. Yeah, I know it's early, we were just saying that before. <laughs> I, I feel the need to apologise to you, even though it's Chris who's got you up this early to do it. <laughs> he's bigger than I am, man, so he's the boss. Yeah, I, well that was a good question, because I was actually asking you beforehand who was the tallest out of, you know, uh, you, Bob, and Demolition, you said you. Who's yeah. the tallest between you and Chris? Chris. He's taller. Right. Yeah. He's claimed 6'4". I'm pretty sure he's 8'3". <laughs> he might be as big as he is. <laughs> <laughs> might be. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, sorry, I know it's not morning, but I've got the morning cough still. I've got a ton of questions for you. I said to the WSI uh, fans and said, listen, I've got the Warlord coming in. Have you got any questions for the big man? So we got about 200 questions back. So, <laughs> and, and, right. and that, that's no hyperbole. We honestly got that much <laughs> much in. So I'm going to start picking the best of the best. And cool. We're going to go uh, uh, timeline basic, and I'm going to throw a couple of games in there as well. And don't be afraid to elaborate on questions, or if you think of something even funnier that you want to say, or a story pops in your head, just jump in and say it. It's freewheeling, don't worry. So, uh, first question is, and it's actually from me, is early days. And I don't know what you were talking about. I think we're talking 1986. How do you go from bodybuilder, athlete, to pro wrestler? Uh, you know, actually, I was uh, training at a, a gym called The Gym in uh, Minnesota, Plymouth, Minnesota. And it just so happened, and that's where the uh, Road Warriors, when they weren't on the road, would train at. That was part of their gym that they owned, Animal and Hawk. And, uh, yeah, I just happened to be working out there and that stuff. And every time animal would come in, he kind of stare at me and I kind of look back, you know, and a little nervous, you know, cause of course being animal and that stuff, you know, and, uh, I, he came over to me and said, you know, brother, you know, you're a big guy, man. You should think about professional wrestling. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know, man. You know, it's, you know, and after about the third time, he finally convinced me to get involved in the uh, sport and, uh, set me up with, uh, somebody to train me. Did you harbor any intentions of ever being a pro wrestler ever? Or were you even a fan as a kid? I was a fan. I watched actually the AWA in Minneapolis. I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, same as all those guys. <laughs> and uh, I used to watch uh, Vern Gagne, Billy Robinson, um, The Crusher, um, Nick Bockwinkle, all those guys on uh, wrestling. Every Sunday morning, man, it would come on about 11 a.m. Who were your guys? Uh, I like The Crusher. <laughs> <laughs> I like the old crusher, yes. Good choice. Uh so Hawk comes in, says, and you finally convinces you you should really be a wrestler. Was he giving you stories of, you know, like sugar plums and fairies dancing, you know, with the money and that kind of thing, or is that how he tempted you? No, he just said it's 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 tough. Exactly. A animal was straight up. He told me it's tough. He go out there, it's rough, man. You're it's gonna be a tough thing and that stuff, you know, but uh, you know, you I know you could do it. Exactly what he said. How'd you adjust to the traveling immediately? Hard. Traveling was hard, man. Uh, a lot of road, a lot of sitting in cars, um, you know, uh, especially in, in some of the territories and that stuff back then. You could go, you could travel 300 miles one way, and as soon as you're done, 300 miles back again and that stuff. I mean, 600 miles round trip plus wrestling, it's a lot. You know, obviously, big guy, six four, six four and a half, three. Uh, what weight were you when you got into the business? Are we talking three hundred? Uh, I was about two, probably about two ninety, about two ninety. And wrestlers are notoriously cheap. And yep. sometimes I'm figuring that they may not have rented the biggest car. Uh, you took whatever was available. <laughs> yep, you took whatever available. So tell me, where was where did you go immediately? Because I know you start in Mid Atlantic very very early, but I've seen uh, you know a list of your matches, and the very first one is in Dallas. That's recorded. Is that the first place you went to? I uh, actually the first place I started up was was, was the NWA, and it was actually for uh, TV. Oh really? Um, it was it was about twenty about twenty five miles north. I can't remember the name of the city, but about forty five minutes north of uh, of Charlotte, and. Uh, it was it was nerve wracking because I mean I was so green I'd only been you know training for a little while, and uh, all of a sudden they said, "Well, kid, you know you're going to go on national TV," and uh, you know there's 2,500 people in the audience out there and said, "Don't worry, there's only millions in the audience." First thing you do is you run to the goddamn bathroom because <laughs> you got to go bad, man. 
But, uh, you know, I went out. I went out with George South. Of course, George South has started out so many guys in the business for the very first match. And I did, what, three moves, pinned them, and here comes Baby Doll. She raised my hand, which she was big at that time, mm -hmm. huge. And there comes Dusty Rhodes. I mean, what a neat thing to start with, you know, having those two people by your side right away. Uh, this is a question I actually wrote later on, but I'll ask you now. Is who was your first, like, big – If I'll, I'll ask you two questions. Sorry, who trained you first, and who was your first big proponent in the business, other than the Road Warriors? Uh, the first one – it was Eddie Sharkey. He trained all the guys in Minnesota, the Road Warriors, um, Nord, Nord the Barbarian, uh, Tijo Khan, Brady Boone, Rick Rude, um, Kurt Henning. I mean, he did all of us guys up there. Um, of course, uh, Crusher Khrushchev, who is one of, you know, uh, let me see, smash of demolition. Mm -hmm. uh, he trained him in that stuff. Um, my very first big match, uh, it was NWA. And it was probably, well, my first one was probably Italian Stallion. He was in NWA. He was my very first opponent I ever had out there. I'm uh, I'm just looking. I, I, these are never comprehensive, but I'm looking. You did wrestle George South in Salisbury, North Carolina. I don't there you know go. That, Salisbury, North Carolina. That's what you're thinking it. of. That's it. There you go, then. Um, you spend a tiny bit in... Uh, bit of time in mid-atlantic and then you go to central states now yeah i was looking at some of your match listings there as well and some of the guys who were there and there's a lot of crossover between mid-atlantic and central states was there a you know good working relationship at the time i suspect there was well the nwa had bought out central states at the time oh already they'd give them, yeah they gave him an influx of money to uh bob guy and bob brown out there and they sent a bunch of us young guys the green guys a lot of green guys young green guys to go out there and, and work in that territory trying to have a look as well because you see you know you're winning stampede matches and uh you know they're really getting behind you and, and apart from where i see italian stallion versus warlord was a draw uh who else was there who else was sent over because i think sam houston was i wrote some other names now i know dennis Condry was sent over there ron garvin sam houston who are your uh, big opponents in central states i had sam houston a lot i worked with sam houston a lot and uh oh is this because uh, well, I, I suppose there's the baby doll connection, but that wasn't an on TV, on screen connection, was there with baby doll at the time? Uh, well, you know, Sam Sam was married to her. Yeah, at the time they were married together, and then she was my manager over there. So, you know, it's a little bit of a thing going on, but it it, it it worked out good. Sam Sam's a great worker, very good worker. Now, I printed out. Oh, I'm very. I'm going to have to say something to the fans. I'm very very sorry. My printer won't print out color. And I've just realized that all the names of all the people who asked these questions were in blue. So I've got a load of questions and a load of blank spaces where the names were. So I'm really, really sorry about that. So I'm just going to have to say this guy said. Uh, the first question from a fan. I'm sorry to say I don't, didn't, didn't get your name. Uh, the first time I ever saw you, Warlord, was in JCP Mid-Atlantic where you didn't have uh, the face paint. And it looked like you were a baby face. When you first came there, there was uh, was there ever any idea of you being the muscle for guys like Wahoo McDaniel or Jimmy Valiant in their war with Paul Jones Army, which included guys like Rick Rude, Manny Fernandez, etc.? No, they never had anything, any ideas for that stuff. Uh, they were just trying to push me as a single, and that's something, you know, I, like I said, I didn't even wear the uh, makeup until I got to WWF. What were your first plans when you got to, so you, you, you're done with Central, you go back to Mid-Atlantic, what are your first creative plans? What do they say uh, that you're going to do? Well, you know what's weird is that uh, after I left Central States, uh, I had actually went to Japan for five weeks, which I learned a lot over in Japan. And I came back to Central States. I said, you know what? I got to move on. I, I've learned everything I can in this in this territory, and I got to move on someplace else. I actually went back home and took back up my old job at the time. Um, I just wanted to get away from everything for a while. And uh, out of the blue, J.J. Uh, uh, Dillon uh, somehow found my parents' telephone number, got a hold of them, and they got a hold of me and said, there's a J.J. Dillon that wants to talk to you. And he said, I really could come back down to NWA in that. So I went back down, and when I left NWA, the NWA was hot. It was on fire. Everywhere was packed. And when I got back, I did my first show. I think it was in Columbus, Georgia, if I remember right. And, uh, man, I, I, I look around. I said, there's nobody out here. This place used to be packed. And because they've been running the same thing for so long, they burnt everything out. And there was nobody showing up at shows anymore. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just kept trying to work my uh, – 
work my gimmick as hard as I can, learn as much as I can, work my gimmick as hard as I can, and try getting over as hard as I can. So if there was an opportunity, I could take care of it. What did when did you start feeling like you were getting a handle of professional wrestling? Because as you said, you know, you had very little training before you were put on national TV, uh, and then you know Central States and everything like that. When how long was it before you started thinking I'm I'm getting the business now? Uh, it took a while. Even in the WWF, it it took a while. It took years. Um, it probably took a good probably like five years, maybe. Um, it, it takes a long time. There's a lot to learn, and even to this day, after thirty some years, I'm still learning. I still learn. I can watch something and and find out there's something new I just learned right now. With uh, I'm going to come back to JJ actually in a second. In fact, I'll I'll do it now. Uh, obviously, Dusty Rhodes was the booker, but I think I talked to Barry last week and he said, "Whoa, yeah, Dusty Rhodes was the booker, but only for the absolute main event guys." JJ Dillon was doing all the legwork for the rest of the guys. So, did you have much of a relationship with JJ Dillon as far as suggesting creative for yourself? No, I I really didn't. That's so how JJ did all that. Uh, JJ is a very smart individual. He, I mean, he, I mean, he did the uh, NWA and then he went off to WWF. He did WWF also on that. You know, I mean, he's done a, he's done so much in the business. Uh, th- th- this might be an unfair question to throw you uh, this early in the morning, but where does JJ rank on greatest managers of all time? Oh, he's up there. He's in the top five, easy. Yeah, easy. You, you got you got uh, Fuji. Um, you got of course Jimmy Cornette. You got Jimmy Hart, um, Bobby Heenan, and I believe uh, JJ Dillon. Mount Rushmore, keep it to a four. Who falls off that? Uh, that's a tough question because they're all incredible. They all are incredible in, in their own way. You know, it's uh, that's a hard thing, man. I, I really wouldn't know on that stuff. Fuji I, been around so long, handled so much. Um, Jimmy Cornet is one of the best talkers, one of the best minds in the business. Of course, Jimmy Hart, same thing in that. Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I tell you what, they'd have to build a fifth one up there. <laughs> Bobby. Of course, Bobby yeah, Heenan. Yep, he's yep, the man. I, yep. I don't know. I don't know if there's anyone out there who says that Bobby Heenan wasn't the greatest manager of all time, but he might be. He might be the greatest manager, and also, you know, all the talk he did on the uh, TV and that stuff. I mean, he was great. But if you talk to Jimmy Cornette, you could give Jimmy Cornette a word, and he could talk about that word for the next hour. Yes, amazing. He is just incredible at coming up with stuff and talking. Incredible. And as we know, Jimmy Hart never slept. Jimmy Hart, he does, never does, and never stops talking either. Yeah, <laughs> uh, is Jim, Jimmy Hart's going to be there this weekend, isn't he? Yeah, I believe so. There we go. Well, you know, we'll see if he's slept in seventy odd years. Uh, you know, if oh, he, he does. He just, he, just, he, he just puts dark glasses on now, and that way, if he doesn't sleep, no one knows. <laughs> That's the spirit. Uh, next question from a fan: How was it work uh, like working with Ivan Koloff, and what did you learn from him? Oh God, Ivan! Ivan was incredible. Ivan should be enshrined in the Hall of Fame. There's no question about that. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, the guy was a bumping machine. Uh, just incredible worker. Um, just uh, he he taught me so much about the the way the business works, um, how to do a match, um, when I should ever take a bump. He says you're so big you don't take a bump to the right time, and uh, you know Ivan would do all the bumping out there all the time. You know. Um, Ivan was just uh, a great man. He really was. I loved Ivan. Uncle Ivan, we call him. Uncle Ivan. Yeah, you picked up straight away that I was going to ask you was, why isn't Ivan in the Hall of Fame? He should be. He should have been a long time ago. Him, and I also believe Demolition should have been there a long time ago. They've they've held the belts longer than anybody else in the WWF ever, or WWE. I mean, you know, there's no question they shall be there, but it's all political. Everything's political. It is all political, but for Ivan, I didn't. I, who knows? I don't know if there was some because he went back several times. You know, obviously did the Bruno yep. thing and yep. held the title uh, when he defeated Bruno for the first time, and he went back a good for a couple of stints, but he never really seemed to stay. So that's definitely a mystery. Uh, have you got any more stories about Ivan just hanging around with him and being backstage with him? Um, that Ivan, you, that you can tell. <laughs> yeah. It's it mostly was is it was business because you know really you know we when we would go do shows we would do a show and then we would drive back to Charlotte at the time so we really didn't stay over in many places and that stuff so there's really not a whole lot of stories except just him giving me knowledge all the time talking to me and teaching me about the business. Aside from Ivan, who were your favorites of the Russians in the NWA? Uh, Nikita was great. Um, you know, Crusher Khrushchev was great. 
Um, they did a great persona, especially especially Nikita. Nikita really got into his character, truly did. Did uh, did you ever just say, dude? We know you're called Scott. You're not Nikita. Just you know, <laughs> speaking the regular voice. Uh, no, because that's <laughs> that's what it was back then. Uh, Kefe was very very strong back then, much stronger now. Now everybody knows and that stuff, you know. But back then, no, you just you don't take away from a person's character. If they want to be that character, let them be their character. Did um did did, did he ever break character when it was just the wrestlers? Um, uh, not really, not really? really. I mean, he would talk he would talk to us in his normal voice to us and that stuff. But as soon as someone would come around, boy, he'd go right back to that Russian thing. <laughs> uh, someone uh, someone else has asked this, and I don't know where it is. Is did you ever work with Vladimir Pietrov? Uh, no, he came in after me. I actually knew him. Uh, from my uh, a gym I trained at in Minnesota. He was another Minnesota boy. Oh, yeah. And he trained at that gym and that stuff. And, uh, you know, he was thinking about wrestling, maybe getting into it. So I suggested something to him at that time, you know. And uh, he came in about, I think maybe about a year, a year and a half after I did, he came in the NWA. Yeah, big guy too, big. Yeah, big guy as well. Uh, yeah. We shall move on. Uh, no, actually, I asked that one as well, damn it. Um, now, a lot of people... I think have mistakenly believed that because you and Barbarian, when you were teamed together, were very much in the same mold as Hawk and Animal, which is easy to see. You know, both all four of you mm -hmm. huge guys, dominant that kind of thing. But a lot of people <laughs> have uh, written in and asked if, uh, and I'll use this as an example: What did Hawk and Animal say to you and Barb about the powers of pain gimmick in the locker room? Were they okay with it? And what were their thoughts on it? Thanks for the memories. Yeah, actually, uh, Animal and Hawk blessed us. They blessed us with doing it. They wanted us to do it because they had nobody to work with and no one bigger, actually bigger and stronger than them, to actually make them true baby faces. They were bigger than everybody. And, you know, when you're a bigger baby face, it's hard to sell for a smaller person hmm. where you get two big, big guys and, you know, they're all, they're huge. They're all muscle. Um, they can move around like you and that stuff. It can make you easy to sell. And, and they're able to, to sell finally, finally be true, you know, being true baby face. And that's what they wanted. But, uh, you know, knowing for a long time, um, they actually helped us come up with the uh, name powers of pain. Also, really, they sat with us one night and uh, we go, we got to come up with a name for you guys. You guys need a name for your tag team. And, and uh, we all kind of just started coming around with names and powers of pain came out mm -hmm. and it was a good name. See, a lot of people are assuming the opposite. Like you were so similar that maybe there was some sort of, I don't know, you know, like uh, like a, a clash of, of similarities in that sense, but I didn't realize that Hawk and Animal yearned to be the smaller of the guys. Yeah, they were, if, if you look at next to, them, next to us and that stuff, we were, Barb and me were massive at that time. I mean, I went about between 330, 340, Barb was 315, uh, Animal was about 305, Hawk was probably about two, probably about 280 at that time, I believe, maybe, right around that. So, yeah, we were... We were bigger than them and that stuff, um, and and we were stronger in that too. That um, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, what? Oh no, I'm sorry, that's different. <sighs> Two or three people have asked the exact same question. Did you ever use fake plates for the 500 pound rep off that was uh, that was televised? No. And the funny thing about that, as I tell everybody, if you if you ever have been a weightlifter. Put 500 pounds on a bar and see how far it bends. Okay, it's at four at 500. But that bar starts to bend some. Um, at 405, not quite yet. But when you get to 500, that bar starts to bend. And if you take a look at that picture, you can see that bar starting to get a little bit of bend to it. Um, it it's not a lot, but you can see it. And uh, no, I was I was that strong at that time. I had no injuries, no nothing. You know, I was at the top of my game and that stuff. You know. Um, you know, you, you're at the top of your strength at that time. And, uh, you know, but he, he got me that day because I, uh, had just done bench about three days before. So I was kind of still a little tight and the biggest thing I was worried about just tearing something. That's what I was worried about the most, Did you but you know, you, you, you get on TV, you know, and, and all that adrenaline just goes through and that adrenaline probably gave me about an extra five reps because you're just like, man, I got to do this. I mean, I'm in front of all these people, all these people could be watching. I got to do this. And it just brings it out on you. Uh, this fella says 19 reps you did. Was it 19? Yep. 19. Do you, uh, do, even, like, you know, not being in front of the cameras or anything like that, have you ever benched that much that many times? 
Uh, I have done, uh, I did, uh, like I said, I did 14. If I remember, I think it was Denver, Colorado. I did 14 at 500. And that's when we were traveling on the road. Um, of course, the air's a little thinner up there. Maybe that helped a little bit. But uh, yeah, I did I did 14 at that gym that day. And then I went to five, ugh, I think 550, and I did it for like seven or eight reps. So yeah, I was I, I was on a different planet at that time. We're going to talk about strength stuff uh, a little later on, but I just have to ask this. Did you ever, I'm, I'm presuming maybe you were a fan of, you know, like the old old style strongman competitions, world's strongest man or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Was that anything you were ever interested in getting into? I uh, not really. I, I I watch it and I love it. I mean, it's amazing what those guys can do. Carrying a car, refrigerators. I mean, my God, that's amazing. Mm. But uh, I ne I never really thought about getting into it. Now. So I'm just there's unless you're the top dog, there's no money in it. Yeah, you so, really can't make a true living. You really can't. So what was it like Marius Puj Pudzinowski? Pudzinowski. Yeah. yeah, I lo I love Pudzinowski. He's a, He's incredible, man! What a what an amazing feat he always did all the time. Yeah, I think, and he, he looked like he looked like a bodybuilder almost. Well, yeah, I that's, mean, that's the other amazing thing. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, loads of them have got you know like the big power bellies and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas he looked ripped as anything. Another thing, he went into yeah. MMA afterwards. You know, for like that yeah, big he, Pol Polish league. Yeah, yeah, he tried MMA and found that MMA is a little tougher than what you think it is. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, that I think he gets paid from that as well because like uh, the Polish league, it's like WS something or other. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name. Right. And uh, right. they always put him in like more like freak fights and stuff like that, you know, like not top yeah. of the top. But man, he must yeah. get he gets paid doing that. Oh, stuff. he's he's a god. He's a god in Poland. Mm. Poland. I mean, they they love Polish people are naturally just stronger people. If you notice another guy in the uh, strongman now, another Polish kid coming up that's really good. So they're they're always doing very well. I can't think of the surnames, but it's the Scottish kids at the moment who won. Is it? It's not right. Stott or something like that. I can't remember what the surname is, but. I do watch it every year. I could just never remember any of the names. Um, let's go back to the Road Warriors before I forget. Who came up to you with that big uh, story between you and the Road Warriors and the bench press and then the turning and all that kind of thing? Whose idea was it? Uh, it was actually the... Uh, uh, if I remember, I think it was The Office. It was probably... I'm sure Animal had something to do with it. I'm sure it did. I really don't know, but it was it was something because... What had truly happened before that is we were having some matches and it was up in the Chicago area. I believe it was Gary, Indiana, if I remember right. And I had done this move many, many, many times, a lot of people, but never, never somebody as big as animal. And I put them over my shoulder, my shoulders up there, walked around with them. I did this move where I kicked my feet out and come back on them. And somewhere or another, my, maybe I just, I guess our size and just the power coming down my, uh, the back of my shoulder blade hit him in the eye and it cracked his orbital bone in his eye. And when he, 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 I could, I knew something happened right. Cause I could see he was hurt. So we got him out of the ring right away and finished the match and went him back. And he went, when he went to just blow his nose real quick, his eyeball started shooting out. Oh no. And that's, yeah, that's how we knew that the orbital was broken. And, uh, so what we did is he was going to get surgery at, but right before the surgery, someone came up with the idea of the bench press contest. Um, and it was a good thing because they could do that when we did the gimmick where we, we took him through his, I threw his head into the plates and worked it that, you know, he was carted off on a, on a stretcher and then they show the surgery. So it worked right into a great angle right there. Everything just kind of worked out that, which not a good way to have it work out, but it worked out that way. Uh, just what I was saying before, it was Tom Stoltman who last won last year, and that that name was bugging me, so I just had to figure that one out as well. Uh, a couple more NWA questions, and we're going to do our first game. Uh, first one is: Did you ever party with Ric Flair? Oh, I've been to many parties with Ric Flair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rick, Rick, Rick lived his gimmick. What he says on TV, and when he talks about the jet setting, partying, everything else, that was Rick. It, it was it was truly him, man. That's what he was. I mean. His parties were crazy and that stuff. I mean, you'd have naked women running up and down the hallways everywhere. Um, just everything would go on, you know. It was, but you know, it was a part of it. Like I said, we we worked very very hard. We worked all the time, but you know, everybody also partied very hard. It was like you had naked women there. You had naked flair there. I, I suspect. Oh that, yeah, it? he was he was the one they were on his back and he was running around the hallway naked too and that stuff, you know, with them. <laughs> oh yeah. When was the first time that uh, Ric Flair just came out in just his robe? Uh, oh, boy. 
For wrestling? No, I, I mean, oh. his wrestling robe, but, you know, in a bar somewhere, and he goes, woo, and then opens it up, and what was your reaction? I, <laughs> I, it was, you know, coming from where I did in Minnesota, man, you didn't see that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, it just everybody just said, that's how Rick is. You know, that just, that's just Rick. So I, I took it for what it was. And... This fella has asked, uh, what were your thoughts or comments to Dusty or Crockett when they told you uh, that you were going to lose the scaffold match to the Road Warriors? And apparently after that, that's sort of what caused you to leave the company. Actually, uh, yeah, I, know, I, knew, I knew right away we were going to lose the scaffold match. Animal came up to me and says, he says, you know what? He says, we're not going to be dropping down. You guys are going to be dropping down every night. And it just so happened right before the scaffold matches were going to start, <clears throat> Sorry, Grizzly Adams uh, from WWE got a hold of uh, Barb and talked to him. And Barb gave me a call at my house at a, on a Thursday night. He said, Terry, he said, we're going to, we got tickets waiting at the airport. We're flying up to Atlanta tomorrow from Charlotte. And I said, okay, I'm, you know, we're off, uh, we're off on that Friday. So I really didn't know what was going to be happening. So I met Barb at the airport. We flew up there. We uh, got in a, uh, they had a, a, a limo waiting for us at the airport took us to the uh, hotel they had a key waiting for us went up to a room opened a room and there sits pat patterson hulk hogan and on vince mcmahon it's like what i mean i'm like wow and they gave us a spiel about coming to wwf and that stuff and they asked barb you know what do you think and he says well when do you want us to start i'm looking at barb I said barb we got all this stuff coming up with nwa you know we got the big show tomorrow night in Baltimore. We got all these scaffold matches. And Vince goes, I want you guys to start Monday. That's like a couple of days from now. And it's like, wow. And Barb goes, we be there. I said, all right, Barb, you know. And we went back and we did that big, big show in Baltimore. And right after that, he went up to, uh, Barb went up to Dusty. He said, Dusty, we go to WWF Monday. And his jaw just dropped. Animal came up, shook our hands. That's the best thing you could have ever done because you guys could be falling every night, man. We're not, you know. So it was a very good decision to do. Very good. How many how many scaffold matches had they booked you for? Oh God, there was a whole bunch and a bunch of nights. They probably had like at least thirty scaffold matches. Jeez. There was a lot. There was a lot. How? I mean, before you obviously go to the WWF, how did you think you were going to get away with doing thirty in a row without getting hurt? I didn't. I knew Barb and me were going to get hurt sooner or later. It was just a matter of time. Being that big, coming down like that all the time, it doesn't matter if you come hanging from the bottom. You're still, even at six feet tall, those scaffolds, I think, were like, what, about 25 feet above the ring or something? They are pretty high. Um, you're still falling 20 feet. Still are. Yeah, that's absolutely insane. Do you think they were booking you to do that to drive you out of the company? Because, I mean, who would stick I, around for it? I really don't know at that time. It was just, they wanted something different from big guys and that stuff, and... uh you know, I I don't like falling from that kind of height. First of all, I don't like heights like that anyway. Mm. Yeah, especially if you know you're looking down, that's going to be you down there. Yeah. I don't know how you get away with it. Uh, because you mentioned the Vince McMahon, Pat Patterson meeting, uh, how hush-hush was it for you to sort of go and see them and come back without being seen? It was hush. No no one knew about it. That's why uh, they got a hold of Barb, and that's I've talked to Barb and set it up that way. So no one know, nothing would get out. Did you have to take any special provisions? Because, you know, like the size you and Barb are and going through certain airports where, you know, people, I'm not saying spies, but, you know, it's, it's, it's likely someone's going to spot you and it's going to get back to the uh, the office. How did you avoid that? Or did you just hope for the best? You just hope for the best. Yeah. There was there was really no problem. Because like I say, it, it happened so quick. I mean, it was a Friday and already by Monday we were in WWF already. As far as the meeting goes, what kind of promises or suggestions or anything else did Vince and Pat give you? There wasn't really any suggestions. It mostly came down that the uh, Can-Am connection had gone hurt. Um, I think it was Tom Zink and Tito at the uh, time. Martel. Oh, Martel, okay. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe that Tom had gone hurt, if I remember right. And uh, they they couldn't compete with the demolition. They wanted to bring in somebody to work with. You know, come in and, and and start with something with demolition, right? Let's just start something real slow with demolition. And, you know, it just has so happened. We were there and it was the right timing. And you were definitely going to stick as a tag team. All right. We're still going to tag team. Yes. Right. So then, okay. First game. 
name association. Now, I am going to give you a sentence, a description, and you throw back to me the first name that comes to mind. And do you know what? If there's a little story to go with it, then please throw it in as well. And the first one is the funniest person in the locker room. And it can be any locker room. Oh, God. Um, I always liked uh, Kurt Henning. Kurt Henning was always good. He's a good ribber, um, but he's also funny. The things he would come up with and say and that stuff, you know, he always had, he always had a lot of energy and uh, he was just a good person in the locker room. Yeah. I mean, you need those kind of guys because, you know, with the grind and everything. Yeah, is, is, uh, How many, what percentage of people in the locker room would keep up that energy day after day after day on tour and sort of like never flag? Oh, there was, there was a lot of guys. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, they, uh, you know, you always got to try staying up as much as you can. We all know we're tired. We're beat up. We're sore. Um, everything else and that stuff, you know, but you know, you still got a job to do. So everybody always try staying in good moods all the time. Mm-hmm. And something, you know, you, if you had fun the night before you talk about it and that, you know, and you know, just, you know, do whatever you got to do to keep everything going. Next one is last man standing at the bar. Haku. I got. Are we talking? Haku. No, no. We're not talking in a fighting sense. We're talking in a drinking sense. Oh, drinking. Yeah, yeah. Oh God. Uh don't worry. Haku will I be would, coming up later. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would have to put uh, probably Berserker, Johnny Nord. That's not the first time Johnny we've Nord. had John John Nord's name thrown out. Yeah, there Johnny. As well. Johnny. Johnny could drink, but John. John. Listen, Johnny was another funny person too. Mm. He was he was humorous. The things he would do and come up with, he was humorous. Were you a big drinker? No. No. What like teetotal or No, I never really drank. I really didn't care for it. Did you hang about in the bars or you know Oh yeah, I would hang with the guys. Yeah, because I want to talk to the guys and see the guys. You know, you always you always we had that camaraderie that, you know, we always one another and look after one another and that, you know. So and I'd always show up and say hi and everything else and make sure everything's good and and if I was tired, I'd take off and go do my thing. Yeah, best way. Absolutely. Smelliest wrestler. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, the one I would have to say would be uh, Brady Boone, his armpits. <laughs> oh, my God. It, it, listen, it's not his fault because he would grab you in a, in a, in a, a headlock, and my God, whew. But I just think it was something that was, uh, you know, genetic. Um because he he showered, he did everything, and that's I just think it was very just genetic. That's all it was. And some people have that. Hmm? It's genetics. Maybe it's his diet or something like that. He's something seeping through his pores. Yeah, it could be. And also another one was uh, Nikolai Volkov. He ha- ate so much garlic, <laughs> you could smell it come through his skin. And I love Nikolai, but and I had to wrestle him and Boris Zukov for a long time. Wow, that garlic would come right through, especially when he would start wrestling, and that sweat would come out. Dang, Nikolai, you're brutal, man. <laughs> brutal. Is it well, okay with Nikolai? There's a couple of things that I hear. One, he was one of the cheapest men in wrestling, and two, he used to cook in his own hotel room with a hot plate. Yes, he did. He did everything on his own. That was Nikolai. What was yep. his signature? But dish? I guess uh, I really don't know because I never asked. Just garlic. I guess coming from yeah, probably <laughs> he had a lot of garlic. I know that, but uh, I guess coming from Russia, that's just the way it was over there, mm-hmm. and he took his same ways over here. The most dangerous situation you found yourself in, in a wrestling sense. Mm, wow, um, that's tough. Uh, maybe um, I know when I was in Kansas City, a guy came in to the ring um, right after we got done wrestling, and you know you don't know if they got a knife or anything on them and that stuff, you know. And it just so happened, my partner at the time was Pork Chop Cash, mm. and he came up and he popped that guy so hard in the ear because I didn't see the guy coming from behind, and he hit him so hard that it it broke his eardrum and blood just shot out. So yeah, that that maybe be probably the most because I didn't know about it at the time. Did you um were you ever involved in any riots or did you at least witness any riots in any of the arenas in Mid Atlantic? Uh, no, but I did overseas one time. Oh yeah. Over in, over in, uh, where was it? It was, uh, South Africa, um, down in Durban. Um, we did a show and of course the champions were Indians and we did the, we did something where the guy that was with me, he used a gimmick to beat their champion. 
And boy, they started rioting. You had about 10,000 people there. They tore down the fences. They, I mean, everything, they broke all the windows in the locker room we were in. They did everything to try to get into that locker room and get the guy. Um, that was that was pretty bad. That was with, pretty bad. With that being said, where's the oddest country you've wrestled in? Were you like in like the, Le- uh, like the Lebanon tours and stuff like that in the early 90s? I went to Beirut one time, and that was brutal. Mm-hmm. It was horrible. I, ugh, it's, uh, it's a different culture and a different world over there. Totally different. Was that the tour where they took your passports? Yep. Yep. They took everything over there. Tell me about yep. it. Tell me. Um, well, we went over to work for this one guy, and it, you know, they grabbed the passports because they didn't want anybody to leave, and that, and because uh, they said it was safer for us holding on to them than you guys. And uh, just nothing ever, ever happened. Never got paid. Um, just a bunch of turmoil on that tour. It was, um, it's something you try to forget, you know, because <laughs> it was, it was, um, wasn't a fun time. No, wasn't a fun time. We'll move on then. Uh, most reckless in the ring. Who would just be throwing them punches and kicks with abandon? Um, probably the most was uh, maybe Kerry Von Erich when he would throw things and do things and that. So just because, you know, if Kerry was straight, he was great. When Kerry would take something before he go out there, forget it. Everything was all over the place. Um, you had to really watch yourself in that. You know, I, I, I love Kerry. Kerry, Kerry was a great wrestler, great person, great heart. He just had a, a really bad drug problem. And uh, it was tough in that stuff, you know. It's tough that way. Do you know, uh, it's, it's sort of uh, quite pressing as well, because as we're recording this, I think next week there's going to be a trailer dropping for the Iron Claw film as well, so I'd be keen to see that. Uh, I also had questions about Kerry Von Eric later on, but because we mentioned Kerry now... Obviously, we know, you know, the hard times he was going through at the time, but let's have some nice stories about Kerry. Oh, like I say, Kerry was a sweetheart, man. Uh, you know, I, I travel with Kerry and that stuff in, in places and that stuff. You know, I mean, Kerry would give you the, the shirt off his back all the time and that. Um, you know, as I said, he was a great wrestler for a guy that was missing uh, a foot. And what he did in the ring, that's just, that's incredible what he did. You know, I, I love Kerry and that stuff and always will. When did you find out that he was missing a foot? Did he ever actually tell you this or was this rumors? No, it was rumors. And it, it had come out that an accident had happened in Japan. And uh, that's where it happened. Um, he never dressed with the boys. He was dressed in his own area, his own locker room. So you knew something was up, mm. you know, when, when that was happening all the time. Yeah. Um, you said before sometimes, you know, could be reckless in the ring. What was the hardest he hit you? Um, well, you know, he always threw that discus punch where he'd do that spinning and then hit the punch. A lot of times he didn't know where it was going to come. Um, <laughs> he hit, hit you in the face, hit you in the side of the head, maybe hit you in the chest. I mean, it was just kind of all over the place and that stuff, you know. Um, you know, I, I know he never meant it and that stuff, you know, just, uh, just you know, what he what he got involved in, it just uh, it put him in that world to do that. Good dude, though. Yeah, he was. Great guy. Uh, the next question is actually the nicest person in wrestling. Oh, man. Probably, uh, you know, there'd probably be two of them. That'd probably be uh, Barry and Bill, Axe and Smash and Demolition. Great I'd, guys. I'd, great, great guys. I'd uh, find that hard to argue with. I interviewed them both last week. Oh. So, like, uh, they, like, you know, I've seen Fargo and uh, Minnesota Nice. <laughs> when I spoke to Barry, especially, you can definitely Minnesota nice. Oh, yeah. Very, very nice. Uh, uh, I'll skip that one. Uh, most memorable thing that you saw happen on Crockett's airplane? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, the Probably the most memorable I have is um, we landed in Charlotte on his private plane, and we were going to get off the plane, and it had snowed. So... Uh, when we land, when we came into to the uh, private airport, there was snow on the ground, but there was ice underneath. And we went to stop. The plane did like a three sixty real quick because of all the ice underneath. But it wasn't it, nothing was happening. So Hawk, you know, Hawk had been drinking with Flair the whole time. He goes, "All right, everybody, very careful when you get off the plane, man. I don't want anybody hurting themselves. It's slippery out there." So we're all getting off one on one. Here comes Hawk. 
He gets off the plane. He takes one step. Boom. His feet go straight up in the air above his head, lands flat on his back. Okay. And animals started laughing so hard. He said, that's the best bump I've ever seen you take in your entire life. <laughs> he said, that was incredible. If you could do that in a ring every night, it'd be incredible. <laughs> you know? So that, that, but that was Hawk, man. Hawk was great. Great. Yeah. Did he have used those bumps in the matches with you afterwards? Because apparently he loved to sell. He well, Animal be the one that would sell Hawk. No, oh. no, it was no, it was uh, it was Animal that sold, right? I think it was Animal that sold most of the time. Um, Hawk Hawk really didn't like to bump too much. He kind of be like a, a spider on you or an octopus. He kind of wrap around you and that stuff, you know. Uh, I know um, a later question is going to deal with basically it's going to be Haku, but with Hawk, how much of a reputation did he have for being a badass back in the day? Oh yeah, Hawk was tough. Hawk, Hawk, Hawk could back everything you could say in that stuff, you know, but, you know, mo- most guys got along with Hawk. They understood Hawk and that stuff, you know, and Hawk was just Hawk, man. He did his own thing. Next question. This is a new one I've never asked before. Most high strong. Oh, God. Most high strung. Um, it would have to be somebody that's very, very, uh, really, really into his character and Probably Randy Savage, hmm. probably Macho Man, because um, he was very intense all the time, very intense person. Um, everything was perfection, and that was Randy. But that's what made Randy so great. Next one, most. Uh, this is an unfair one, I know. Most talented wrestler that you ever wrestled. Most talented I ever wrestled. Probably uh, there's several. Um, Bret Hart, of course. Um, Bret Hart is just an incredible wrestler. I always said. If you couldn't have a good match with Brett, you shouldn't be in the business. Should mm-hmm. not be in the business. Um, another one, Arn Anderson. Great, great wrestler. Definitely. Th- those guys are, are two in the top ten wrestlers, man. Incredible wrestlers. Um, I would I would definitely put those two. Definitely uh, those two. The next one is the most miserable wrestler on the road. Who, you know, just always eel the donkey. <laughs> um... Let me think. God, that's a hard one to answer because I pretty much got along with everybody in that stuff because I just did my own thing. Um, I, I really I really couldn't answer that one right there. Okay. I, I really don't know. Best jobber? Uh, probably George South. He started out so many guys in the business um, jobbing for him and made them who they were. Mm-hmm. George South is like the king of that. If there's ever a... a Mount Rushmore for jobbers. George South is number one. Have you He's got right the other, there, first one? Have you got the other three? Um, maybe uh, that I couldn't answer, but definitely George South. He's king. Everyone, everyone basically says either George South, Barry Horowitz, or okay, that's that's what I'm... <laughs> yeah, Barry Barry's incredible. And I think the uh, third ones we get are either the Mulkey Brothers or I Mike Sharp. Iron Mike Sharp, and I loved Iron Mike Sharp. He was he was funny, funny. You've, right, everyone tells everyone tells fairly similar stories about Iron Mike Sharp, but I loved them all anyway. So go on, give us the uh, why was he funny? Mike came into a town one time, and he got to the match about fifteen minutes early. He was the first match, and Chief J Strongbow goes up. He goes, oh, whoa, 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 big man, uh, where have you been? And Iron Mike Sharp looks at him and goes, Chief, you won't believe it. But they moved the town. I looked at the map, <laughs> and they moved this town from what the map says. And I couldn't find it. And I finally figured out where this town was. And Chief was like, look at him. Like, he, he couldn't he couldn't say a word because he didn't know what to say. And Mike would all up in his bag. First of all, he had like a gallon of baby oil. Okay? And he would just throw on his tights real quick and just, just slop that stuff on him all over the place. And he would do a couple of warm-up things and that stuff. And right, right to the ring. But after the match, he would do his workout in the place. He'd do like an hour, hour and a half workout afterwards with what, all the stuff he had. And then he would take a shower and he used about five different soaps. He was just a freak on that stuff, you know, and different shampoos and everything else. But that was Iron Mark Sharp. What's it, right, so we hear the OCD stuff. I mean, uh, obviously, you must have heard the story about the time he got locked into the arena. Yep. 
He did. What happened? He did. I, I don't remember what arena was, but he just kept working out and the lights went off and there's Mike and Mike couldn't, he just, what the heck, you know, he had to call somebody to get the place opened up. <laughs> he was still there. Yeah. I, I've heard that story several times. Occasionally people say security dogs were let out. Yeah, I'm sure they did. But I mean, you know, I'm sure they probably made one last round and found him, you know, but Mike was that way. He would just keep going until the last person was gone. With um, with Mike's OCD, was it only about the cleanliness or was it, you know, flipping light switches 28 times on and off kind of thing as well? Or was it just the cleanliness? I think it was just the cleanliness because I never saw him do any of the other stuff. He was just a clean freak. Uh, next question is, biggest carny? God, biggest carny. That's another tough one. I, I, I really wouldn't know that one either. I can move on. Really? Okay. Amazingly, the next question is worst worst abuser of spray tan or baby oil. Uh <laughs> Mike Sharp. <laughs> Easy. Easy. He'd bring a gallon of baby oil and he'd just like I say, he'd just slap it on. And he'd use a lot. I Mike know, was but incredible. He's so hairy. It. Why would you do it that when he's so hairy? It didn't matter. He loved that baby oil. <laughs> he loved it. Good for him. Uh now this one I want to add in. Because uh, you actually mentioned Chief J Spr- Strongbow, so I've added it back in. Best and worst road agents. Um, best ones. Uh, ones I liked a lot. Uh, I love Chief. Chief was great. Chief was straightforward. Um, probably the worst one was uh, Tony Gurria. Probably he was just Tony was nice, but he was lazy. You know, Rene Gillet was good. I liked Renee. I liked uh, Jack. He was good. Um, but that 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 would probably be right. And listen, I, I like Tony Gurria a lot. I really do. But you know, he was just you know he was just kind of there. Mm. You know, just there. Do you do you remember very briefly when Nick Botwinkle was an agent? Yeah, and I let yes Nick and I like Nick a lot. Of course, watching him on AWA growing up, it was kind of special because you know seeing him and also here I am and I'm. I'm seeing him in person. That's up in front of me, and actually working with him all these nights. I um, I used to do a podcast with Don Morocco weekly, and he was always the opposite about Nick uh, Nick Bockwinkel because I, I, he still blames him for getting fired in '88. But I'll I'll save that story for another time, uh, or you can just go onto the YouTube channel. You can find it. I'll give you a few more, and then we'll move on to the sort of like bulk of the rest of the interview. And uh, smoothest worker. Hmm. Smoothest would probably be, uh, as far as a match, Bret Hart. Mm. Bret Hart was, like I say, man, he was uh, he was a great worker in that. You know, um, uh, easy matches. Um, he knew how to sell for a big guy. He knew how to work for a big guy. You know, so it was uh, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed working with Bret very very much. Now for this next one, you can't say yourself, but the biggest ladies man. <laughs> Not me. Um, I had my women, believe me. I had I had my women in that stuff, but uh, no, it would have to be. Uh, mm, well, of course, Rick. Rick's right there. Mm-hmm. You know, he's on top of there. Um, probably the tag team of uh, Shawn Michaels, Marty Jannetty. Oh yeah, they had a lot of they had a lot of women everywhere. They always did. And when Rick Rude was around, Rick Rude, yeah, mm-hmm. Rick. Was it you know for just anyone on the card? Was it just so easy? Just they'd be in the hotel rooms, you just pick them off. Oh yeah, you could you could just one time I uh, was uh, uh, NWA and if I remember right, I went to one of the guys' rooms. I can't remember who it was, and there were like ten women in there. And he goes, "Man, just pick one." He <laughs> says, "He says just pick." And he, boom, you're gone. You pick one, you're gone. It's that easy. I mean, it was it was that simple back then. Huh? Hey, the benefits of being on the road. Eh? I mean, that that's gonna help the loneliness a bit. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's. Uh, <clears throat> it gets lonely, man. You're the same thing, same grind every day, you know. I mm. uh, will give you uh, give you a couple more. Heaviest smoker? No, no. Heaviest smoker? Um, wow. Ooh. You know, I really didn't hang around anybody that really smoked in that stuff, so I I really can't answer that question either. Loudest spot caller? <laughs> uh. God, maybe maybe Nikolai. Oh, really? Because he would just yeah, he would just say something really loud in the ring and that stuff when he would do in that stuff, you know. Um, 
Yeah, it was just it was just Nikolai. Nikolai was a loud talker anyway. <laughs> I remember someone telling me, it's like, hey, you could be loud back in the day because the, the fans were so loud screaming all the time. You could just yell yeah. stuff to each other. Yeah, and the rings weren't mic'd either back then. Now they're all mic'd. Now, uh, worst injury you ever saw? Mm. Uh, God. Probably it was in a TV. If I remember, I think it was Tampa, Florida. The Rockers were working with two guys on TV. And they did a uh, – there's a big lawsuit after this. Yeah, I know. Uh, they were doing this one, they were doing this one uh, move with this one guy. And I had heard that he said he could do the move, and I, I really don't think he knew how to do the move. And, of course, he didn't do it right, and his head went down to the mat. He became paralyzed, and they didn't know about it. And I think if it was either – I think it was Marty that climbed to the top rope or Sean, one of them, and they came off the top rope and landed on him after that yet. But they didn't know that he had been hurt like that. That was probably the worst one I ever saw. And then, of course, you know, we knew something was wrong and, uh, you know, it just wasn't a good situation. Chuck Austin, the guy's name yeah. was. Yeah. I remember yeah. there was a, uh, he was a rocker dropper. Yeah. And he was supposed to take it flat on his stomach. And he ended up sort of taking it like a DDT. That's what I'm saying. That's why I say I really don't think he knew how to take it. But of course, a lot of those guys just want to be on TV and they would say they could take it. Uh, <clears throat> something more fun now. Biggest ribber. Uh, that's a couple people, man. Kurt Henning, incredible River, um, Owen Hart. Owen was great. Um, Davey had his moments on being a good River. Of course, he was worse. He was worse when he was a dynamite. There are much more rivers at that time. Uh, Davey, not so much by himself. Um, but probably, probably the, the biggest River probably was Owen Hart. Mm-hmm. I've uh, I, I've written a book on Owen Hart and I collated about 160 different ribs that he did. Yeah. So yeah. everyone's Owen, Owen, Owen was great at ribbing. He was he was good, but he he didn't do bad ribs. He did funny ribs. Did he get you? No, he did Davy one time, and that was good because uh, we were in Denver, Colorado. We just got done working on Gold's Gym, and uh, Davy wanted to catch a tan, so he gets it set up with a guy. He goes in the room, gets in his shorts. Lays in the bed, and after about a minute, Owen looks at me and he, and he just starts he just starts smiling, and they he would go up and about a minute to and he would go up and click turn it off, and Dave would come up. Oh, 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 what just happened here right now? Someone turned off my tanning bed. I can't believe this right now. I got to get my tan. And the guy said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, man. I didn't know and that stuff. You know, maybe there's a little problem in that stuff." So he said, "I'll, I'll turn it back on for you." David went back in. So Owen, after about two minutes, Owen looks at me, starts smiling. He went up, click, turn it off again. David comes back out again, just hot. What's wrong with this tan? I'm not getting a tan right now. I don't have so much time. I got to get my tan right now. And the guy goes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, man. I'll, I'll, let me do it again for you. Let me try again. And so he turned it on again for 30 minutes. And so Owen waited a little bit longer this time, maybe about five minutes. And he looks at me, he smiles again. And he goes, Click, turn it off again. Now Davy's steaming. Yeah, what's, 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 I, I'm not getting a tan. This thing's, this thing's terrible. It's horrible, man. This thing don't work in that stuff. He said, I've been there for a half an hour and I've got about three minutes of tanning time, you know, and Davy was just hot. I mean, he was just hot on that, you know, but that was kind of fun ribs that Owen would do on that, you know? It was it was fun watching it because I was just laughing the whole time. I was trying to keep a straight face. Did, Davey must know. Well, Owen's in the building. He must know that Owen's got something to do with it eventually. <laughs> he, I don't know if he did or didn't, because every time what happened, Owen would hide someplace, or he'd look like he was still working out. He'd run back out on the floor like he was working out yet. I, uh, I've got three more, so uh, worst driver. Oh, God. Um, Davey Boy, maniac. Hmm? I let him drive a couple times. We were driving, and he would get on the tailgate of everybody. I mean, be right on their bumpers. Like, Davey, what are you trying to do? Kill us, man? Uh, we got to get to the town there. <laughs> Davey, let's get to the town safe. I said, pull over. Let me drive. I mean, it just, it was nerve wracking, man. Because you always be on everybody's bumpers. And, uh, you know, it, it was crazy. And when, I remember one time I rode with a uh, tugboat and I woke up and he was sleeping. No. He was sleeping at the wheel. Yeah. Because he had that, uh, you know, where he had, a, he had a, uh, uh, the sleeping disorder. And he would fall asleep just, just driving. Well, like narcolepsy you know? or apnea or yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what it was. 
And uh, man, I was scared. I said, man, pull over because I don't want to die today. I'll drive. I'll take care of it. Hang on. So I'll he did, he didn't tell you beforehand. Is that like, listen? I've got no. narcolepsy. No, I I I, I uh, roomed with him one time too. Same thing. He would stop breathing, and it was scaring me during the night because I was like, <laughs> he'd wake up and that stuff. You know, it's like, oh my god, I can't I can't stay like this anymore. I'm not getting any sleep. It was doing it all night. <laughs> you know, it wasn't his fault because I don't think he knew it at the time. And then finally, he got a CPAC, and that which helped a lot. Do you know, just because we were talking about David Boy before, and obviously a couple of questions later on, because you wrestled him so much. Somebody mentioned that you wrestled him on every single pay-per-view in 1991. Yeah. It was like four or five yeah. pay-per-views, and you wrestled him in every single one of them. How come you yep. and David Boy were paired together? Uh, we just match up so well together. Our, our, uh, just by God's will that, uh, you know, both being big, both being what we could do, and Davey had been in the business for so long. Davey was such a great wrestler. Um, our, our, just our styles went just, they, they, they went together so well, which was really nice. You know, thank God. Cause Davey, I love Davey, man. I loved him. How many times did you beat him? Uh, never, <laughs> <laughs> which is, Hey, that's fine by me. Cause I'm losing to a, a person that's an incredible wrestler, you mm. know, and Davey was, and Davey looked great. And, uh, so it was, it didn't bother me a bit. One of my very first videotapes from wrestling, because I started watching like 93, but then my brother's, my older brother's friend he had a load of tapes and he gave me, and one of them was WrestleMania 7. And I always loved the match with you and Davey Boy because it's all built yeah. around the full Nelson. It's yeah. like, so, I mean, there's, I mean, a couple of things I can say about it. One, you hear the crowd, and all you're doing is just doing that, and you hear the crowd going crazy, which I think is such a lost art now. As you know, something so simple can get the fans up so much. Most legit tough badass. Haku. Yeah, Haku and then Barb right behind him. Yeah, those two in order. I interviewed Barbarian last year. And I think the old joke is, is that the only person that Barbarian ever said he was afraid of was Haku. And the only person Haku ever said he was afraid of was Barbarian. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. It's true. They're both Tongan. Um... You know, they're both, that's the, that's their style and that stuff, you know, and, and they're both the nicest people in the world, but, uh, you know, they hit that button and, and they go and they don't stop. There's, uh, a, something to do with the fact that when you know that Haku or Barbarian or like the Samoans, when they stop talking English during an argument, that's when, you know, shit's really on. Yeah. Yeah, it will. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a few people also said this, is that you have a story with Haku where you're trying to eat pizza. Mm. Or you're trying to eat, and then you can... But then some people are bothering Haku. I think that was in uh, St. Louis, if I remember right. Um, I think it was East St. Louis. We had done a show in St. Louis that night. And so afterwards, we went to East St. Louis, and we went to this one club, and uh, uh, I think I... Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was grabbing something to eat at the time, and some like if I remember, it was four guys, and they were giving trying to give Haku, you know, crap. And next thing I know, uh, I mean, Haku had all four of them down in a second, boom, just like that. So the person that was working there, um, he was off duty police officer, and he came over to it, and what I had read in the paper is that he was a former football player for L.A. Rams at one time. And in the paper, it said, you know, I used to hold my own on double teams in football and do and do okay. He says, this man took me and threw me like I weighed 100 pounds. He literally took me and just tossed me across the room like I was 100 pounds. I mean, he said, I've never had a person like that ever do that in my entire life. And that was Haku. You got to remember, Haku trained uh, sumo, so he knew the center of balance. He practiced those punches like they do over there, uh, practicing on the, on the uh, poles, those real quick punches. He had those big legs. He could kick above his head right in your face, right there, and he was fast as a gazelle, and he was a 300-pound man. Mm-hmm. I mean, tch, incredible athlete, incredible person, and just tough as nails, tough. Did Was that the only time you ever saw Haku in action? Uh, No, I saw him in a nosebite incident, Baltimore. I was there that night. Um, just got done talking to him, and he was doing great. You know, I was with Tonga Kid, and uh, we were just walking around. Next thing I know, is Haku staring at this one person. The place was packed. 
It's called the Safari Club. And all of a sudden, he just starts going straight down through the crowd. And I'm looking at him, I'm going, well, what's up, you know? And all of a sudden, he just grabs this guy and just bit his nose, bit it off. Boom, gone. You know, I uh, just don't know why. Just He just saw the guy and something about him, mesmerized him, and that was it. Jesus. You know, um, you know, but it, it's the way Haku was. You know, like I say, Haku, and if you ever talk to him, he's incredibly nice. Mm. Such a nice person, you know. See, a, a lot of people, I've asked this a couple of times, Haku versus Brock Lesnar, in their respective primes, who do you have? I'll take Haku. Really? Yeah, I'll take Haku. Listen, Brock is strong, okay? Um, Brock was a great, great amateur wrestler. Um, but... If on, on the feet, but Brock can't kick. Haku could kick. And Haku's fast. I'm sure he's fast. I'm at his prime faster than Lesnar is was at his prime. Um and he's just strong and Haku just has that ox strength. So I know he'd hold his own no problem that way and that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And Haku can also punch. He can punch and he's fast with those punches. Mm -hmm. They're not boxing punches, they're fast, they're quick punches. You know, like the sumo's throw. And they move you, and they move you, and they move you, and boom, you take the person, you know? I, I would take Haku in a second. The very last question in this little game, the most memorable backstage fight. Oh, boy. You know, in our time, there really wasn't any fights backstage. Um, the, the guys got along pretty well in that stuff, you know? Um, you know, I, I know there was some, but there was really nothing, nothing on my time that I could really... I can really talk about back there that I really saw that was really bad. Um, maybe the only thing I ever saw was um, Andre and uh, Big John Stud up in Duluth, Minnesota. It was cold as hell that day. And they were doing an angle and John screwed it up. And he knew he screwed it up. And he got out of that ring. And all I remember is him getting out of that ring. He didn't even grab a shirt. He just grabbed his bag and ran to his car. In about it was about 15 below zero outside in Duluth, Minnesota, and probably about 40 with the wind chill. He didn't care. He wasn't going to do it. He would just grab his bag and ran because about two minutes later, there comes Andre looking for him. I mean, he wanted to grab John really bad. That's about the biggest thing I could probably say. What What was it about John Studd and Andre? Because they wrestled together for years, like WWF and outside of the WWF. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm thinking, surely they couldn't have hated each other or Andre couldn't have hated John that much. But what was it about the two that never got along? Um, you know, just um, I, I I couldn't tell you any more than that. That was just the only thing I ever saw. You know, the two of them went together because John was a huge guy. And Andre was the biggest guy I've ever seen in my entire life, by far. Hmm. Um, so it, it it was just something that you know they they could work together well. But Andre was very. It, Andre wanted everything to be perfection. You know, he was really into that. And if he didn't, Andre would come after you. He would. Andre, if he liked it, he loved it. If he didn't, run. That's why I always say it. Run. Uh, now, we established beforehand your 6'4", uh, 6'4 six, four, six, four and a half around that range. How tall was Andre the Giants? Oh, God. When I first got there, he was definitely over seven foot. Um, in the end, I think he was like seven foot, but he was definitely over seven foot. Hmm. Probably seven two at that time. What, yeah. what time is it? 88 eight, around that time? Uh, 88, yep. Okay, uh, one very quick question uh, <laughs> that I forgot to actually ask beforehand about the initial uh, coming into the WWF with Barbarian is how come you brought in as good guys? Uh, because we were kind of taking over the spot for the Can-Am connection. That's why at the time. So, so, they wanted so it was always temporary. Guys. Yeah, just temporary. Yeah. Well, I thought it was going to be more permanent at the time because uh, I really had no clue when they were going to do that Survivor Series, the switch at that time. So uh, I thought it might be permanent and that stuff, you know. And uh, listen, I, I I love being bad or good. Bad or good, it doesn't matter. They're both fun. Both are. Who came up with the design for the face paint? Uh, I did. Um, it was tough at first because I'd never face painted. Barb had been face painted for a while. And... Uh, we barb at first we did some different designs 
And Barb looks at me, says, Teddy, he says, you got to learn how to do this. I don't want to do this no more. You know, this is hard every night, you know, doing mine and doing yours, you know. So I just got looked in the mirror and started practicing, practicing, practicing. And I finally found a design that I liked. Uh, I asked this to the demolition guys and neither of them said yes, but were you a big Kiss fan back in the day? Yeah, I love Kiss. Of course, I got all their I got all their stuff. I got their uh their uh uh what do you call it? dowels. I got all that stuff. I love Kiss. Yeah. Were they any inspiration to you with the face paint or was it just your own thing? No, just my own thing. It was kind of a combination of uh um it wasn't so much because I didn't even really think about even Kiss doing it. Um, it was more about uh, Batman. Oh, really? They put the Batman single up, and uh, you know they put it. The uh, I just kind of took it off that and just kind of made that design a little bit, mm. and I just kind of liked it. Why were you paired with Baron von Raschke immediately? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't know because they just wanted to give us a manager, and it was it was a really cool thing because Baron came on that big robe. Um, we would take and put white face paint on him to make it look even more evil because he keep it down. So you put it up, you see all that white face paint. And Baron was a great talker. Mm. Very good talker. Did he jump over about the same time as you did with the WWF then? Uh, to the uh, WWF, excuse me. Right afterwards. Right afterwards he came in. Yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned this before, the big turn at Survivor Series where you and Demolition, or you and Barbarian versus Demolition, Mr. Fuji switches allegiances and, uh, you know, I'm sure for a fan at the time it sort of made sense because, you know, you you, you two, you and Barb were probably bigger than Demolition as well, sort of like the Road Warrior thing. And you looked really scary together as well. That's why I was going to say, you know, it struck me so odd that you're actually the good guys uh, coming in. But uh, who proposes this to you? Because this is, you know, this can be a risky endeavor trying to switch two teams at the same time. Yeah, we really didn't know anything about it till that night when we got to Richville Coliseum in uh, Cleveland, and uh, they said, "We're you're gonna be doing a switch." And I said, "Switch." They said, "Yeah, you guys can become bad guys and uh, demolition become good guys, but Fuji's gonna go with you." And uh, it just so happens that the uh, the match went off great. the The tag teams were incredible out mm. there. I mean, having that many people out there and just having a great match that's that's a, that's a great thing. Um, and but the hardest thing about it is actually people didn't realize that we were going bad and Demolition was going good. They thought Demolition was still going to be bad, and Fuji made the change, and Fuji now was going to be good. Ah. So for the next three weeks after that, till we did our next TV, people didn't understand it. So we would have to do a match as, as heels, and the people still were cheering us, and then we'd have to go jump uh, a baby face after he get done doing a match and win or something, and jump him and beat him in the ring every single night. So we were doing double duty every single night to get over his heels because no TV had come out yet for three weeks. So we'd do that for three weeks. It was a pain in the butt. <laughs> you know, pain. How, how could anyone cheer Fuji? Uh, uh, you'd be surprised. People like Fuji. They like Fuji, Master Fuji. <laughs> you know, they did really he, did. A lot of people did. Did he start traveling with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fuji traveled with us all the time. Go on, how was that? There's got to be a Fuji travel story. Did you ever let him drive for starters? Oh, I had to drive all the time. Barb didn't drive, and Fuji sat in the back seat. And after the matches, he'd grab his 12 pack of beer and drink his beer, you know, and he'd tell us what we did wrong and, and what we should do right. So, because um, I'm always interested in, you know, the veterans telling the young guys at the time what you did wrong, what you did right. So, what was he looking at in your team and thinking, this is what you can improve? And what did he improve? Um, he just approved the chemistry in that, um, the do's and don'ts, um, when you should take a bump, when you shouldn't take a bump out there. Um, you know, he was, he, he'd watch a whole match and that stuff, you know, and, and like I say, right as soon as we get in the car, he'd go over it real quick while everything's in the mind and that stuff, you know, and, and it really helped improve all the time, you know, and it, it helped me a lot. Did he rib you? No, no, never ribbed us. No. So he never fed you your own pets or anything like that then? No, nothing like that, man. I <laughs> At least I hope not. <laughs> at least I hope not. No, you never met, you know, asked him to cook dinner or anything? No, no. Listen, Fuji, Fuji took care of me. When I got married, he set me up the uh, Hilton right on the, uh, right in Honolulu, right on the goddamn ocean right there. Beautiful. Very top room and that stuff, you know. And he took care of me when I was over in, uh, in Hawaii and that stuff, you know, for the week and that stuff, so. You know, Fuji, we got along, we love Fuji, and Fuji loved us, so. 
it was nice. Now, uh, this next person has written in and said, uh, I always felt the Powers of Pain and Hercules should have got a bigger push back then, but nothing could ever rival Hulkamania. So I'm actually going to add on to this and say this leads me to this question. In a company full of body guys, do you think there was any like rivalry or you know other body guys looking at you you know, and maybe thinking, ah, oh, man, he's really big, and sort of judging you pure, purely on size or maybe even a bit of jealousy between the body guys? Is that something I'm making up in my head or is that something in reality? No, I'm sure there was. It's like any sport. It's like bodybuilding and everything else and that stuff, you know. There's always animosity when it comes to uh, somebody who might be bigger, better, look better, and everything else and that stuff, you know. And you know, But you just kind of kept it to yourself and that, you know. And it's, it's the way the business is. Mm. Well, you can only control your own destiny yeah. in that sense. That's right. You? Yep. Now, uh, this was going to lead out to the workout questions, but I've snuck in a couple of extra ones that I'm very interested in. Uh, this fella is, and I don't know how um, I don't know how uh, you are with like numbers and money and stuff like that. So if you don't want to say any numbers, you don't have to. Don't worry. Uh, but this fella says, "What was your biggest payday in the NWA and your biggest payday in the WWF? And financially, what was your best year in wrestling?" Uh, my biggest payday in NWA was like five thousand dollars for a pay per view. Um, my biggest payday was with uh, British Bulldog in uh, WrestleMania 7. I think I made 25000 Wow. You know, which at that time was good money. Um, and my biggest year was WWF, which I think was that year. And if I remember right, it was like uh, two, about 250000 with royalties and everything. About two fifty. Yeah. So they were looking after it. I mean, that's that's... Well, that's half a million in today's money plus yeah yeah do you, you know just speaking of money did you notice because obviously in 1992 uh, business falls off for one reason or another did you notice the paychecks going down in your last few months yeah they went down i, I really noticed that when they ordered the uh, wbf when they brought uh, world bodybuilding federation our paychecks went way down because you know he had to pay all those guys and he was paying those guys good and it pissed a lot of us off because we're doing all the work we're making all the money for them and these guys aren't doing nothing and they're making all this money, you know, and, and it, 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 like I say, it pissed a lot of us guys off. You never thought of making the switch over then, did you? No, not, not that. I, no way. No, mm. they're nothing like us. And they weren't, there's no, you know, camaraderie. There. There's no nothing with amongst those guys. Nothing. When did you first find out that the world bodybuilding federation was going to be a thing then? Uh, just through the grapevine, hearing about it, that Vince was thinking about starting a bodybuilding league. So, yeah, it is what it is. What are your paychecks like? What percentage did they start going down to fund the WBF? Probably about 25%. That much? Yeah, that much. Yeah, they went down quite a bit. Who who figured out that it was directly the, the WBF that was siphoning off your profits? It wasn't hard to figure out because we still were having big crowds. And all of a sudden, our paycheck's going down after that started. Mm. It's not too hard to figure out. Did you meet any of the guys? Or Yeah, we met some of them. And uh, they were scared of us. <laughs> they, they really didn't want to be around us too much or anything else because they are afraid of getting ribbed. Um, everything else and that stuff, you know. And, you know, they're just, you know, they're bodybuilders. They're not, they're not tough. Mm. You know, they're not like the guys were. Now, you mentioned royalties before, and I'm very glad you did, because this leads me on to my next questions about merchandise. And you were featured in the very last... Uh, I, I don't know too much about the figures, so bear with me if I'm getting things wrong, but you were featured in the last of the LJN line, you know, the big uh, figures, mm -hmm. on the Black Card series. And now I looked this up. Uh, this is the rarest of the series, uh, something like 1989. And I also looked up what a warlord on mint on card is worth now do you know what it is or roughly it's pretty good i i don't know but it's it's up there three thousand seven hundred and forty three dollars for a single warlord yeah i believe it i believe it i know it's 2500 at one time um but you know it's it's i mean it's listen it's it's cool having all those action figures because no matter what happens to me in this world, if I'm gone tomorrow, I still live forever. Because mm -hmm. I live through my action figures. I live through all that stuff. And it's just, it's an awesome feeling. I know you've you got the house. so many people. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Carry on. Um, you know, you touch so many people and it makes you feel so good inside. 
How many figures, because I know you had a Hasbro figure as well. How many official figures do you have out of you? I have that one. I have Hasbro. I have two Jacks. I have two Mattels. I have Epic Toys is coming out now. With Actually, the first one's a Barb Me Together, mm-hmm. which is really nice because I've always wanted to be with, for some reason, they just haven't made Barbarian figures. So I was so happy they're making Barb Me Together. Um, they've got some nostalgic figures coming up for Epic Toys that Barb Me are going to be on. Um, uh, there's some other things, um, Greg Gagne in the United States, we're going to be on action figures with his group coming up. Um, that'll probably be starting next year. Um, so it, it's fun having all that stuff. You know, I've been lucky enough to be on tops, um, wrestling cards, you know, which of course being tops is the name, you know, biggest name in, in wrestling cards and, and just cards alone. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's really cool being in all those things, you know, it really is. And, uh, I know I'm in, I'm in the game, uh, Came out just recently, WrestleQuest. Mm-hmm. I'm in that game with Andre and Randy Savage and all them. Um, so it's it's a lot of fun, man. There's a new game like, actually coming out, I believe, in Scotland next year that uh, a guy's designing right now. Um, but we're gonna be you can you can wrestle us, and we're in 3D and everything else. You can turn us all the way around. All, all specifics about you. It tells everything about you. Um, looks really really cool what they're doing over there too. With all the merch and stuff, what were your do you remember what your biggest sellers were, and do you remember what you got the biggest cut off percentage wise royalties? I, uh, I think the uh, the first one. I think I got like uh, for the big figure. If I remember right back from WWF at that time. I think I got like thirteen thousand. Wow, which you know was okay on that stuff. You know, uh, um, that was a limited run as from, well. It was only in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they're. They were given better paychecks back then. Paychecks have went way, way down since then on royalties. Um, the uh, the Hasbro, I can't remember. The Jacks, I did good. Um, and the uh, the Mattels, I did good. The the last Mattel I just did, I think I made like about 8000 on mm-hmm. that one, the last one that came out. But, of course, the royalties have been cut down so much now. You make pennies on the dollar now. Yeah. Yeah. Um. You were also in one WrestleMania console game on the Amiga that I read as well. Um, I, I don't suppose you got any payment for that game. It's like 1991, I think. And you were no, one I of the probably got, guys. Uh, yeah. yeah, I probably got nothing on yeah, it. Probably not. Probably. Uh, right, we're going to go on to the workout questions now. And obviously a ton of people want to know a ton of workout questions. So I've sort of amalgamated them all into one uh, section. So when did you start getting into bodybuilding? And how old were you when you started looking in like peak warlord shape? Okay. Um, I started lifting when I was in college. Um, I just had a little weight set at first that I had in my room. Um, you know, every day I would get, I would get back and then doing my schoolwork and that stuff. And I would, I would hit, you know, just basic stuff and that stuff, you know, um, finally I was able, you know, where I had a little bit of money and that stuff. Cause of course in college, you don't have much money. And, uh, started training this gym called King's gym in, uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa, where I went to school at university of Northern Iowa. Um, started training there and, um, my body just kind of took to it. You know, I went from, uh, let me see, two, two fifteen. I went up to about two sixty five, Um, and, uh, and I just, I really started like, I just really started love lifting. So lifting got into my, my blood at that time. Um, the peak was probably about 1990, right around when I did that bench press and everything else. Mm-hmm. that's when I was probably at my strongest, um, my best, my best physique at that time, everything else and that stuff. Yeah, probably about them. Everyone loves this one. Maximum lifts, bench, squats, uh, deadlift, any others? Okay, maximum uh, bench was 640. Um, I never went maximum on on a squat just for the fact that, uh, you know, I didn't want to tear center, tear up my back or anything. Because, you know, in wrestling, we already had backs that were hurt already. Um, I would do, probably I could probably go up to like 405, but I'd do it for a bunch of reps. I was doing a lot of reps. Um, front squats, um, hack squats. I would do all those kinds of things, you know. I was never a heavy one. Um, my best uh, deadlift, I think I did 600, if I remember right, for eight reps. And that's with straps. Mm-hmm. Um, I, used, I used straps at that time. Um but, uh, you know, once I started getting into wrestling, you know, I, I hurt my back 
and I couldn't do the same thing anymore, you know? So I did, I did other things to keep my back very strong in that. Um, you know, it's, it, it, when, when you hurt your back, it, it takes a lot of that away from you. It's, it's very hard to do those kind of movements, especially squatting, especially deadlifting. Um, it got tough doing that. Uh, how many calories did you have to put in your body every day to maintain size? Whatever I could. <laughs> I ate everything. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter what it was. It, it, the people got to remember, we were traveling every day on a different commercial jet every morning, going to a different town. Um, you know, you're burning so much energy all the time. Um, you get to the town, you eat, you go ahead, you take about an hour nap real quick. You get up, you get to the gym, you get a good workout in, you get back, you shower, you eat again. You got to do a show every night. And it was that constant every single day. And you need those calories to keep your body going. Um, so, and like I say, no matter what you ate, it was going to burn. Mm. You were going to burn it. It's the way it was. You know, back then, you remember, you didn't have protein powder. You didn't have any of that stuff back then. So you're trying to break in as much protein as you can through whatever you could eat. And the only thing you had back then was those god-awful amino acids, those big pills that were like eating, you know, they were humongous. <laughs> You know, you try gobbling those down, you know, but it's, it's how it was. It's uh, like, it's like, uh, if you ever hear Mike Phelps talk from swimming, he was eating like 10,000 calories a day. He was eating everything in the world because I'm burning in the pool. I, my training, I'm doing so much in the pool that I'm burning every single one of those calories. And I need those calories. Uh, <laughs> you don't think you ever got to 10,000 calories, do you? No, I don't think I ever got 10,000. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's a lot. Uh, most frequent workout partners? Uh, Davy Boy, Barb, Animal. Um, you know, definitely guys that are into lifting. Definitely guys that look good. Um, hey, I even know I was at Boris Zukov. Boris Zukov would go train with me. You know, he would do it every day. He, he said, I'm going to do what you, what you do. He's like, I can't do what you do, but I'm going to be there and do what you do. You know, so any, anybody that ever went me, the only one I didn't was Black Bart. Oh yeah, Black Bart was funny. He go, he go, he 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 take his chew and he goes, "You go work out for me. I'm gonna nap, and then I'll grow from it." You know, <laughs> I mean, Black Black Bart was great. He's a mm -hmm. sweetheart, sweetheart. Who's the who's the most deceptively strong? Uh, Paul Roma. Mm -hmm. Paul Roma is very strong. Um, I mean, he looked great, incredible. Oh my God, he's ripped veins, everything else. And he ate pizza every night. He'd eat a pizza every single night and still look like that. It was amazing. But once again, I say, you're burning so much all the time that it didn't matter what you ate. Um, but he, Paul was a very strong person. Very strong. You know, I, I had something in my head that I couldn't think of before. I've just remembered it. Did you ever try Ico Pro? WWF's, you know. Uh, I don't think so. No. 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 Heard nothing but bad things about that. <laughs> but, you uh, know, the science was very new. Yeah, it's, you know, they're trying to make money, like everybody else. Who rarely worked out yet still looked amazing? Mm. Um, probably, uh, oh boy. I can't say, I, I didn't see Rick Rude work out a lot, but he looked unbelievable. Um. And he might have, he might have been to different gyms than I did and that stuff, you know. But Rick was, uh, Rick was an incredible looking person, mm -hmm. ripped, great body, everything on him, him and that stuff, you know. Um, uh, I, I don't know about Kurt Henning, um, but another one, he looked great too, great. He was in great shape, but I don't think he really worked out that much. But he's in dynamite shape. Now this is more like a more general gym thing but what are the most common lifts that people still do in the gym that put them at most risk of injury and that they shouldn't be doing or finding alternatives for uh the most risk the biggest thing in in, in weightlifting is learn how to lift correctly don't be sloppy don't be uh doing things you shouldn't be doing um you know of course stick to your basics which is your bench, um, your squat, if you can squat. Um, 
deadlifting, you know, not so much deadlifting. I mean, deadlifting is nice, but I wouldn't go heavy. I would do more reps and build endurance and that stuff. Um, and yeah, that that's a hard question. Like I say, you know, the best thing to do is just learn how to lift correctly. Be careful. Be safe. Um, you know, take your time. Um, and if you need a spotter, always have a spotter. Mm -hmm. Always. Always. Now, uh, quite a lot of fans have written in because they want to know, you know, bodybuilding stuff as well and, you know, comparisons with other wrestlers. This fella says, how big were yours, Barbarians, and Ultimate Warriors arms in 1989? And did they ever work, well, uh, did they ever work out together? And what were their lifts? But uh, comparing arms and size and all that kind of thing. Uh, I had the biggest arms. Um, Warrior was just shredded. He His arms weren't really that big. He was just shredded. I mean, he looked incredible, <laughs> you know. Um, Barb's arms were big. Barb had humongous triceps, huge triceps. Mm. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it, we, we weren't really, the only one that kind of got into the arms thing was the animal meat. We'd always joke about it, who had the bigger arms and that stuff all the time, you know? Um, but, uh, it's, you know, I, I really couldn't tell you much more than that. Just, just, uh, you know, we just enjoyed training. Now, uh, this person's already said, but you pretty much answered it. Did you ever work out alongside the Ultimate Warrior and any stories of Ultimate Warrior? Uh, I never worked out with Jimmy. Jimmy always trained on his own. Jimmy was Jimmy. He did his own thing, and that's and that's why I loved him for it because he didn't, you know, he didn't bother anybody. He just did his own thing. Um, probably the story I'd have one time is we couldn't get any food or anything else and that stuff and he was all pissed off and so he had a big huge bottle of aminos and he just opened his mouth and just started dumping the aminos into his mouth i can't take this anymore i gotta eat uh, i'm just gonna eat these aminos i'm just gonna keep shoving them down my throat and just water and aminos and water and aminos i mean that's the way jimmy was you know jimmy was a he was a fanatic he was now uh, I asked quite a lot of people at Ultimate Warrior because, you know, people love Ultimate Warrior stories and the, depending on the person, we run the gamut of, you know, really loved him to really didn't love him and, you know, sure. stories of also him knocking out quite a lot of jobbers. <laughs> Seems to come out quite a lot as well. But uh, I know for a fact that you're a big fan of Jim, Ultimate Warrior. Uh, why mm -hmm. is, is is he mostly misunderstood? I believe he's misunderstood. Um, the Jimmy I knew was very, very nice, very, very giving um everything else in that stuff uh you know um listen um people say good and they say bad about jimmy and uh everybody has their own opinion um but like i say the jimmy i was around i got along with gray and i love jimmy i love being with him was he the guy who would blow up the quickest uh yeah but <laughs> when you got to do what he did let me tell you you got to come out of that locker room and you got to go from zero to 100 just like that. And you got to run to that ring. You got to run around the ring. You got to jump up on the on the apron, back and forth in the apron, shaking those ropes, in the ring, shaking those ropes, then hit the ropes inside. My God, it's just you've been sitting there the whole night. And also you got to go zero to 100. And I would be blown up too. I'd be all blown up. How did you make sure that you didn't like get blown up in matches? Because, you know, you're even bigger than Jim was. So, I mean advice as far as basically like pacing a match and not k killing yourself out there every night exactly what you just said you pace the match if you start getting a little tired you grab a hold you grab a hold to catch your breath and that stuff and you go into another spot and if you're a little tired you grab a hold again you know that's what you do uh one last thing about warrior is that i believe he bought into a promotion in las vegas called nwc in 1995 uh did he bring you guys in after he bought it no, no, never did. Never, never, never worked with Jimmy after that. No? I did one time on a European tour. Um, I think it was a 93 to 94. But other than that, no, nothing with Jimmy. Okay, one last question about bodybuilding. Then we'll get on to something else that I've uh, previously asked it's okay to. Uh, this fella says, you were with Rick Rude in the NWA and the WWF. Please tell us if Rick ever hit legs or was it all just upper body, brother? Uh, I think pretty much upper body. He's kind of <laughs> like Hawk. He said, that's what you have long tights for. <laughs> you know, that's what you have him for. Is that but legitimately what he, he said? Did. Yeah, yeah. But that's exactly what Hawk said. He said, he said, he tried training legs with uh, Animal Me one time and he hurt his, his back. And he goes, 
that's why I don't train legs. That's why they give us long tights. That's why I wear them. You know, <laughs> so that's the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you ever say, did you ever hear Rick say, it's an up, upper body business, brother? No, I never heard him say that. No, never did. But, you know, everybody to their own. And his upper body is one of the best ever was. Well, undeniable. Undeniable yeah. there. Yeah. Now, um, for people uh, who are interested, uh, when I interview somebody, I ask somebody, you know, if there's any contentious, uh, you know, questions that may come up, I say, listen, is it okay if I ask this? And Wall was very kind and said, yes, he was. Uh, a couple of you asked about steroids, so I'm going to put a couple of questions to, I'm going to kill that fly first before it, you know, it's been flying in front of my face for an hour, never mind. Uh, this fella has asked, uh, what was your I'm just, I'm just, I just got a cough real quick. Oh, yeah, you carry on. So, uh, sorry, uh, right, we're, we're all coughed and flies are dead. Uh, now, uh, this fella has asked, what was your steroid cycle in the 1990s? Every gym goer wants to know this. Uh, I did Tess. I did, uh, let me see, I did uh, DECA. And I also did, uh, there's one other one, I can never remember the name of it, but it would, it would, it would just make your, your, veins like cables in your body i can never remember the name of it anymore um i did some testoviron but i didn't take a lot of everything i just did a right combination that they all work together and that's what made it work for me really good so cycles then how what's the what's the cycle situation back in these days with these fairly uh, early steroids i would do it actually what i would do is i would cycle it for uh between the uh, pay-per-views because we did pay-per-views every every three months so i would cycle hard for the two months before the show and really get into it and, uh, and then for after i was done i take about a month off and then i kick into two months again right before the next show so every show you're at your peak all the time in that mm -hmm. and then you give your body a little rest when you're done because you're not doing anything big you're just doing house shows you know so it, it really doesn't matter as much during that time you know and then you start kicking it up again you know, just like, just like being a bodybuilder, mm -hmm. you know, same thing in that stuff. You know, when you're, when you're off, when you're off cycle and that stuff, you know, you're relaxing a little bit in that stuff. And then when you get ready, you start kicking up about eight weeks out of your show and you kick it really hard all the way up to the show. So that's exactly what I would do. Now, uh, something else I want to ask you about is human growth hormone starts turning up in what, maybe the eighties. And it's like a really early version of it, which it's because you mentioned John Studd before. And I believe that he famously did HGH, but like how dangerous was HGH or like the initial versions of it back in the eighties? I, I couldn't tell you much about that because I never touched it. Mm -hmm. I've never touched human growth hormone in my life and that stuff. Just, I, I don't know why people ask me all the time, you ever do growth and I've never done growth. No. Do you remember, or the, do you remember seeing the effects it had on John? Um, I really couldn't notice because John was just a big guy. <laughs> he was just a big <laughs> man. He's big enough anyway. I don't know why he yeah. touched it. I, I don't know either in that stuff. I mean, the guy was huge, so I really don't know. Now, um, amazingly, this was the most asked question, and I promise you we'll get off the steroids and we'll move on to the more fun stuff for the last half hour or, or less. Uh, a lot of people wrote in with an anecdote that either Kevin Nash or Scott Hall said. And the story goes is that either Shawn Michaels or Kurt Hennig, the name changes with the telling of the story, uh, gave you a jab once and they couldn't press the needle in and they looked at you and said, dude, I think you're full. Is is that true? It probably was. I mean, my my ass was hard rock. It was rock, <laughs> rock hard back then. Oh, it's it's the way it was in that stuff. You know, I mean, you know, you you're doing it. You know, every what I think every three days I was doing in that stuff. You know, two two jabs a week. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's I know that when you be driving in, in a car and that's you put like a pillow under your butt and that stuff to you know make it feel a little bit better and that stuff. You know, it's it's the way it was back then. Mm -hmm. Did you um? ever meet dr zaharian oh yeah yeah don't like him no oh, he's a rat he's a rat he's a stooge i i never liked him then i would if i saw him now i would probably grab him by the throat um not a good person um you know whatever you do in life if you do something wrong you get caught you deal with it don't rat everybody out because of save your own ass Mm -hmm. You know, not good and that stuff, you know. And he was doing something wrong. He was using his doctor license to make a lot of money. He was making a lot. And he was charging four times the amount of what I could get things for, you know. And then he was sending FedEx to the guys. And, uh, 
you know, he would, we'd be in Pennsylvania. He op- he would take your blood pressure and he opened up a bag. He said, anything you need. And I look at that stuff and I said, how much? He says, that. I said, I can get it four times less than that. And the same thing, you know, I mean, that's a ripoff. I said, that's terrible. You know, you're ripping all the guys off. But of course the guys knew if they got it through him, you know, they figured it'd probably be safer, you know, um, where I had my connection that was really, really good and really good stuff. So I just never liked Dr. Zahorian at all. Never cared for him. Were you ever asked to testify at the trial? Yep. Oh, Second really? one on the stand. Yep. I did the, uh, uh, what was that show? Dark Side of the Ring for the steroid trial. Um, and uh, as I said in it, I said, uh, they asked me, have Vince ever forced me? I said, Vince never told me, Terry, if you don't take him, you don't have a job. Nor did he, nor did I ever see him ever sell anything, give anything, do anything to anybody. Never did that. So what we did, we did on our own. I mean, we, I had been doing it long before I got to WWF. And as most of the guys did, they were doing it long before they got to WWF. You know, um, you know, it just, uh, it just wasn't a good time. A lot of things coming down at that time. Um, a lot of changes. And, uh, you know, it was a, it, it wasn't a fun time. Did you think Vince would win? Of course. There's nothing he did wrong. He did nothing wrong. It, it's just, it was a witch hunt. That's all it was. Somebody, he pissed somebody off and somebody had some power somewhere and they wanted to, they wanted to get back at him. They wanted to get his ass. And Vince never did anything to anybody. He never told anybody to take him. He never did. But of course he liked as a promoter because it made him a lot of money. Mm. Same as I would. If I was making that much money, I'd be happy too. You know, I uh, listen. I want to thank you very much for. I know it's not the most comfortable thing to talk about all the time, but you know I do appreciate you. Uh, yeah, no, it doesn't bother me on that at all. There's nothing to hide. Nothing. Now let's have a. A lot of people have also written this in. We're getting off the steroids now. More of you, more of the character, and everything. So, why were you and Barbarian split up? What was the reason given? <clears throat> I really don't know to this day. I really don't know. The only reason that they told us is they want one to work with Ultimate Warrior and one to break off and work with Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted. And, uh, you know, I I had matches with Hulkster, which they went really well and the place were packed. But just, I don't know if... I really don't know a lot of things that happened behind scenes at that time. I really don't. Uh, This fella said, uh, I I, I believe this is just supposition, he's having a guess, but I don't know if someone else has said this. Were the powers of pain broken up because Vince had signed the Road Warriors... And maybe Vince thought too similar. It could be. It possibly could be because they were bringing the Road Warriors in and that stuff. Um, but then again, you know, you know, it, it would have been great letting us work with the Road Warriors also in uh, in uh, WWF at that time. You know, because we had great matches the NWA. So, but I I really don't know the reason. No scaffold matches though. That's where you draw no. the line. No, that's right. No scaffold matches. <laughs> so, um, how many matches did you have with Hogan? Uh, I think I had four, if I remember right. I had four. Indianapolis, uh, Nassau, a couple other places. And then Barbie worked with uh, him and Bossman as a tag in a couple places also. Now, you know, once again, you don't have to give the numbers, but well paid, even on a house show against Hogan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you work with Hogan, that's a golden boy and that stuff, you know? Mm. That's a golden egg right there, man. You... You're going to make money. You're going to make, oh, at least four figures, maybe five. So, yeah, per match. Yeah. Hey, well, you know, you can't – well, no wonder you wanted to work with him more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, you're split up. Um, you have some matches with Hogan. And then what's the meeting where I'm presuming Creative Services has mocked up a new outfit for you? What's the first time that you see that you're going to be having, you know, like the half mask, the wand, the outfit, the whole thing? Tell me about that story. Yeah, it was it was it was shortly after we split up, and they said, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, give me a, a a new look and that stuff, you know, still same, still being warlord, but new look, and they did the same with Barb, and uh, I saw I liked it because it's very futuristic. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really it was really neat. It's a, it was a really it looked like a comic book character, which you know I I did like a lot. I liked that. Did you have any inputs in the outfits themselves or did they just present you something and you went, good? Nope, they presented something. I said, good. 
Exactly. <laughs> that. They showed me. The, they showed me the drawing. I said that looks really nice. If it can look like that, it'll be good. Did you have to go for like special fittings for like the half mask kind of thing? Yep. Um, they gave me that first mask, and I really didn't like that one because it was very heavy. It was kind of gaudy looking. And then they said, you know what? We we found a place. They do co- they do costume designs for a lot of uh, movies, and uh, we want to fly to Upper New York, and you know they'll they'll fit this one to your face. And I had to sit there, and they put a straw in, in my mouth and plastic of Paris on my face, and I sit there for a couple hours till it hardened up, and they took it off, and that's how they made the mask right to my face. <laughs> this yeah. this wasn't like a guy called Stanley in an apartment, was it? No, it was it was actually a costume, big big place. I'm trying to think. Uh, did anything else? Oh, Phantom of the Opera was it? Phantom of the Opera inspired, or did you know the inspiration for this? Uh, probably like that. Yeah. Probably Phantom of the Opera. I wouldn't doubt it. Now, this is something that I want to know. I don't know if you'll get the reference, but there's a character in Mortal Kombat called Kano who looks remarkably like you, and that comes out a year later. Did has anyone ever said, "Hey, we, you know, we sort of based the look of this guy on you"? No, no, never heard nothing of that. No. no. Did you suspect? <laughs> it could have. You never know. People, people take ideas from everything else, and that's. I mean, it's the way the world works. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Nothing pretty much is, is a first-time thing. Everybody kind of takes something from something else. Uh, this fella has asked, was it a total <laughs> bitch to have to carry all that stuff around with you? Yes. Pain in the butt. You had to carry an extra bag, big, big uh, suitcase. It was, it was a pain. It was. <laughs> uh, how much did it all weigh together? It wasn't heavy. Huh? Stuff was not heavy. It was um, like a really hard plastic, so it didn't weigh that much. Now, you know. we... Uh, I've only got one more page of questions. I, while you went away for a couple of minutes, I scrubbed out like half the script just to try and get the best ones. Uh, now, as you said before, you were wrestling Hulk Hogan a few times. Were you told at the time when you were split off that basically, dude, you're going to be in the main events longer than it turns out you were? Uh, yeah. You know, basically, like I said, they want you to have a run with Hulk Hogan. It just never really materialized. We had good matches, but it just never materialized. Uh, how many times did you go to Japan under the SWS banner? You know those WWF super shows. Um, I don't know if I went to Japan or not. That was for WWF at the time. Yeah, I, I've got it where you went a few times. I know. I, I know. I went for War for Tenru. Um, I, I just I can't remember back then. I can't remember that part at all at that time. I probably did. I just don't remember. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll I'll briefly tell you, if you're bothered anyway. Um, yeah. You reformed the powers of pain, in fact, against George Takano and Shunji Takano. You wrestled Tenru. You, uh, those two guys I mentioned again. You wrestled Ashura Hara. Never heard that name. And then a couple more tag teams and stuff like that. So apparently you went okay, uh, that was, five Okay, that was probably for war then, for Tenru. Probably war. No, no, SWS apparently in 91. Was that SWS? Okay. Yeah. Um. Wow, maybe maybe they changed their name after that because I know I went back in uh, '94. I went for Tenru, which was War at that time. So maybe maybe the name was changed. Oh I, yeah, I think yeah. I think that thing closed up. Uh, yeah, they had like a wealthy yeah. backer, and then there was a recession, and they closed up, and then right. Tenru did War. Right, that's what it probably. Yeah, uh, and Tenru Tenru was great. Tenru was a good worker, uh, big guy too, big guy for Japanese. Hey, do you know we've not we've not talked about Japan yet, and I like to always get guys because uh, you know I've been once. I'm going again next year. I love Japan, and uh, talk about the culture shock of the first time you went to Japan. Oh my god, it was it was rough, man. I'd be there for five weeks. I'd never been out of the United States, and all of a sudden you go to a culture that's totally different than ours. I mean, you know, we go everywhere, and you know, food's so plentiful, and you get so much of it. You go over there, and you know, it's very expensive. And you don't get much food. And you, you know, if you can't read Japanese, you don't know where to go, what to do. It was it was very, very tough for me to do that. Um, the person who helped me was Bad News, uh, Bad News Brown, who became Bad News Allen. And uh he took me under his wing and he started showing me around the place to eat, the place all you can eat and that stuff that were a really good price. Um, he really helped me a lot when I was over. So when I got to W, I was very appreciative and would thank him all the time for doing that for me. Because I was starving. I mean, I was losing weight right and left. Of course, when you're a big guy, that drives you nuts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the story I also hear a lot about Japanese wrestling, the first time you get there, that 
sometimes you might be smartened up to what you can expect in a match and sometimes you might not be and those dudes hit hard and they'll test you. Mm -hmm. What was your mm -hmm. first match or first series of matches like in the experience? And My very first match was Fujinami. And Fujinami is a big name over there. But they gave me this finish which was like 10 minutes long. I said, that's a finish? <laughs> I mean, that's like a whole match. And it's like, wow, you know, I mean, um, but, you know, of course, Fujinami being very Americanized, you know, he wasn't so stiff in that stuff, you know. Um, but you want to be stiff over there because people believe in it. So you got to be stiffer anyway. That's the first thing they told me when I, before I went over to Terry. They said, be stiff. Don't be afraid of being stiff because that's what they want. And so I was stiff and Fujinami was stiff back. It didn't bother me a bit. I enjoyed it, hmm. you know, and he really, he really helped me a lot for my very first match. And we had a very good match over there. Did some of the young boys try and test you? Because they're, you know, they're trying oh, to get they, themselves over as well. Yeah, they would try. And if they try, you just, you just, you give it back to them and you just give them back a little bit harder. You know, if you knock them out, you knock them out. That's life. You know, I mean, that's the way it was. You know, they're trying to, they're trying to make their, uh, trying to move up in that stuff. And, you know, you, you have to respect them trying, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't care if you try it. It's not going to bother me because I'm just going to, I'm just going to do whatever and I'm going to take over anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you, know, you get him in a corner. He let him start doing those kicks, and they kick, 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 kick. Finally, just grab the guy in the leg and throw him. You know, that's enough. Done. Mm -hmm. End of story. What was the most lucrative run? Because I think you wrestled for New Japan, War, SWS that you didn't remember, in fairness. But uh, what what was sort of like your best run in Japan? Um, My my first time I went over there, of course, with uh, New Japan, or Noki. That was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Um, it taught me a lot about wrestling. Um, also with, uh, Tenru, I went over for a couple weeks at Tenru and that was a really good time too. I, I enjoyed it and just learned a lot working with the, with the wrestlers over in Japan. Uh, I'm going to ask you one question from Mexico and then in the time we've got remaining, we'll do uh, our final of the games and then I will thank you so much for your time and let you sort of like, you know, suffer with the cold in peace away from me, at least if nothing else. <laughs> uh, this fella has asked, what's the story with Warlord appearing in Mexico for AAA 94 and being the muscle for Jake the Snake Roberts in his legendary hair versus hair match with Conan? Yep. Um, it was a lot of fun, man. That place was packed. I mean, it was, it was full. And, you know, it was just... It was fun just being in Jake's corner. You know, you knew Jake was going to get his head shaved. That was going to happen. And uh, they went ahead during the match where a bunch of his, uh, Conan's uh, people came, grabbed me, and uh, went ahead and uh, handcuffed me to the to the ropes and that stuff, you know. So I couldn't get it to help Jake and that stuff when Conan took over and beat him. And then after, he, after that happened, I, I broke the handcuffs and got away. But by then... Jake already had his head shaved and that stuff, you know. Mm. But uh, it was a lot of fun, man. I enjoyed it. It was great. You know, Jake the Snake Roberts in 94 and a hair versus hair match. I mean, the stakes seemed quite low in that one. He, he, didn't, he didn't seem to have much hair to actually shave. No, no. Jake was pretty... Jake didn't have a whole lot. Of, he still doesn't have a whole lot of hair. So, um, but it, it's, just, uh, it's just a factor of shaving Jake the Snake's head. Mm. You know, just see him bald. Yeah. How good was Mexico in 94? And actually, this is another question is, how over was Conan? Because I don't think people realize just what a megastar he was in that time. Conan was huge. He was like a Hulk Hogan over in Mexico. He really was. Like Davy Boy in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, Conan was that in Mexico. Humongous. How well did they treat you in Triple A then? Because, you know, it's a really young company, I think, at this time. And they're trying to make, you know, a big load of noise because EMLL at the time is, you know, the incumbent. But, uh, yeah, I, I suppose the AAA run for you and how much you enjoyed it and how different it was compared to everywhere else you've been. Oh, yeah, Mexico's different, man. It's, uh, it's a different culture again in that, you know. But, uh, you know, the wrestling's very very similar to ours in that. Um, you know, a few things different. But uh, I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed going to Mexico down there. It was a lot of fun, except... On the way back, I caught Montezuma, Montezuma's revenge. So I was going to the bathroom like every half an hour, really, really bad. It was not a lot of fun, you know. Um, <laughs> so you never got a little bit of back. You, you never no, got used to the food of, then. No, I never. I caught some kind of a bacteria in the water someplace, man, and it was not a good time for a couple of days after that when I flew home. No, I do not envy you. Listen, we've got ten, pretty much ten minutes exactly, so we're going to do the last of our games. I'll thank you for your time. Call it the firing line. I'm going to. It's exactly the same as no name association, yeah. but I'm going to give you some names. If there's a little story with the guy, if 
fantastic. And the first name was Kerry Von Erich, but we've talked about him. The second name is Rick Steiner. Oh, Rick was tough as nails, man. Rick, if you ever shake Rick's hand, he's got a very strong hand. He's got a meaty hand. Um, you know, tough guy, of course, coming out of the University of Michigan. Um, wrestling, great wrestler. Loved him as the gremlin. He was dynamite at it, you know. And, of course, he was dynamite with his brother and that. Him and Scotty were great together. Mm. Um, but I, I love Rick, man. I always got along with Rick. And every time I see uh, every time I see Rick at uh, signings and that stuff, man, we always – Next morning, we're always down having breakfast together and everything else, you know, and I really enjoy Rick a lot. Who's crazier, Rick or Scott? Uh, Scott, Scott, Scott. Rick can be crazy, but Scott is, yeah, Scott, yeah. He's, he's, now he's, now he's easy mellow now, mm. but in his day, when he's in WCW, forget it. <laughs> did you have a ex- pump? Forget it. Did you have an example you could give us? I wasn't around. I wasn't around him that much, so I can't say. I just know. I've heard. <laughs> Fair enough then. Yeah. Akira Maeda. Um, really don't know much on that one. Don't know too much on that one. I'll move on then. Crush. Oh, Crush, big guy too, man. Out of Hawaii and that stuff. Um, I met Crush the very first time. Um, same time I met Chris Benoit. They were in Japan at the uh, train at a dojo. They learn how to wrestle, and uh, and then of course he came into WWF when I was there. Um, another guy, sweetheart of a guy, big guy, tough guy, and a very good wrestler. And he went along. He went along well with uh, Axe and Smash. Big Bubba Rogers, boss man. Oh, I knew Boss Man from the very first time I came to NWA. Um, what a great worker! Um, another guy, super nice guy. Um, but what a worker he became. And uh, he actually, when we went, he was with me, we went to Central States and we actually roomed together um, until they called him back to the NWA. Um, we shared room, we shared an apartment together and that stuff. And he was just a very quick learner. And when they gave him the big boss, man, I mean, he took that nightstick and the first thing he did, he started working with that nightstick, right? We learned how to use that thing. And I mean, he was, he could whip that thing around and just like nothing. Mm. Yeah, really good. To, like that, did not. Really, yeah, really good at it. Next one is Sid. Um, Sid was Sid was different. <laughs> um, not another just tall guy. I always had to look up at him all the time. Mm. Um, you know, another one just he had a he had that look. Put it that way. I mean, you look at him, he just give that. They're just like, wow, man. He had that just that ferocious look on his face. You know. Another one, big guy, good worker. Um, I, I have, I've picked a lot know. of big guys here. I don't know if that's just like your influence on the names I've picked here. Uh, the next one is yeah. someone we don't hear from very much at all, Chris Walker. Oh, Chris was – Chris, I, I love Chris. Chris Trayvon with me. He was another guy that was a very strong workout person, very strong in the gym. Um, Chris Chris could do anything out there. He was, he was another one that he should have been given a push somewhere because he looked great. Um, he had the look too. He had that look. He looked like you said he could look like he could have been a bodybuilder on Motley Crew, mm. you know. Um, you know, but they just they never gave him that push on that stuff, which I never understood because he definitely deserved it. Jimmy Valiant. Um, Jimmy was you talking Boogie Woogie Man? Of course I am. Yeah. Okay. Boogie was great, man. Boogie's just another guy, just funny guy, you know. Um. Great ring, great charisma in the ring. What he could do. He, didn't, he wasn't a great worker. He didn't have to be a great worker. He could do it, but he didn't have to. He was a gimmick. He was kind of like the Bushwhackers, a gimmick. And he was he had this gimmick down so good. And it was just so fun to watch. And he'd make you laugh. You know, he's just a funny guy. I was going to say, dude, he was a great worker. He didn't take any bumps. And he could that, still get the crowd. Exactly. Like that. That is a great worker. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That charisma out there, man. He had great charisma. Tony Schiavone. Um, great talker. Um, good at what he could do. Very smart individual. Knew a lot about wrestling. Um, and, uh, you know, most of that's it. You know, just very, very, very smart person in wrestling. Knew everything about it. Dino Bravo. Tough guy. French-Canadian. Um, good, good, good bencher. 
Very good bencher. He could bench. Um, you know, didn't have to be a great worker because of how he did things. Um, but you know, he was over big time with that French Canadian thing, you know. I mean, really, really big with that, you know, just very sad what happened at the end of his life. Um, very, very hard thing in that stuff because you know, everybody liked Dino a lot. Everybody did. Was this um not to go like too far down the dark side of the ring thing or anything, but was this anything anybody was aware of in the WWF locker room that he was dealing with like contraband, essentially? Not at that time because he was he was making good money. It's when Vince let him go, he had a big house. He had a lifestyle up in, in Canada and in, in uh Montreal, and he had to do something to make that kind of money yet. And he figured that was a way to do it. And um uh, it's just unfortunate. Marty Gennetti. <laughs> uh, Marty to this day is still a nut. Um, at that time, he was a better worker than Shawn Michaels. Mm-hmm. He was an incredible worker. Great talker. Um, he could do anything in the ring. Marty could do anything. But he just had that that dark side of him that had to be crazy all the time. And, you know, the, the drinking and, and everything else and that stuff, you know. Um, but to this day, I see Marty, man, we give hugs and that stuff, you know, cause he's such a sweetheart of a guy and that stuff. But let me tell you, he's a, he's a fighter too. He's a fighter. He beat the heck out of Sean one time at a holiday Inn in, uh, Denver, Colorado. They got into it and, and he blackened his eye, other things and that stuff. And Sean took off for a week. He flew home. He flew home. So Marty beat the heck out of him. Were you actually in the locker room for this? Uh, no, this was in the hallways at nighttime. Ah. I got a call. For, I got a call from my room from the girls that were hanging out with them saying, Terry, Marty and Sean are having a fight. And that's, I'm just let them wear themselves out. You know, <laughs> next time I went to the hallway, everything, everything in the hallways broken out. Um, Marty's in the room, sleeping under the bed and Sean took off. Sean took off. Okay. I've been given the three minute warning. So I'm going to have to pick some <laughs> really good names now here. Uh, very quickly, Manny Fernandez. <laughs> Oh God, Manny was, uh, he was one of the first people that, uh, when I traveled, he was very nice. I, I, when I first came into NWA, I didn't have a, a, a credit card. I didn't have nothing. And he would let me stay with him when we travel because he had a credit card, and everything else and that stuff and give me rides and everything else and that stuff, you know? And another one, he was another, you know, his raging bull was a great, great worker in NWA. Lex Luger. Lex was I, I i like i i really like lex um he's a good person but when i first met him he was very narcissistic when i first met him um really into himself would come to the locker room to kind of put his bag down not say hi to the boys everything else great physique um and then after a while after he got to w he really changed a lot once he got to wwf he changes he became very very nice very outgoing everything else that stuff so and to this day, every time I see Lex, I really like Lex a lot. And he went to the WBF as well, so I thought he'd be like enemies yeah, for a short while. <laughs> yeah, he did for a short while. Yeah. Um, John Tenter, Earthquake. Oh, God, big guy. Kind of like Moose here. Mm. Um, but let me tell you, he he could work, and he could take bumps. When he took a bump, he could take a bump. We had a match in Japan that we tore the house down where I had to slam him three times and then he and then for him to win, he had to pin me. And I slammed I slammed him. I, I had to take him off his feet three times. Um and I actually uh I slammed him, I suplexed him and held him up above my head, suplexing him. And I had another one where I was gonna slam him, and then at the last second, whoops. It's all right, I've got you. Okay. <laughs> at the last second, um he kicked his feet and then I went down, and at the end he beat me. But uh Boy, he could work for a big guy. He had endurance. He could go. Yeah, I don't understand why people don't put him in. You know, when people say, oh, the greatest super heavyweights of all time, earthquakes one seems of them. get missed out quite a lot. No, he's one of them. Definitely one of them. And the last question, God, my tummy's rumbling now. I can't imagine, you know, you've had no breakfast for two hours. I can't imagine how much yours is rumbling. But the very, very last one we're going to go with, Bob Backlund. Uh, just old school. Tough old school. He was actually my uh, six-man uh, tag team champion partner with uh, War. or uh, Yeah, it was War. Um, with uh, uh, Scott Putsky. We had the six-man belts over there. 
And he was funny to watch. He was a just a great guy in the ring. Super, super pleasure to be around. Always wore a suit coat. It could be 100 degrees out. He's wearing a suit coat. But uh, he's just a dynamite wrestler, man. Dynamite. Did he have that talking dictionary with him? He had everything with him. Bob <laughs> had everything with him all the time. But like I say, you know, Bob, Bob lived his gimmick. He was very good at it. Great at it. Listen, uh, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. I've wanted to have you on for a very long time. Um, of course. Before I let you go, any plugs that you want to throw out there? Any merch you want to let the uh, viewers know that you've got going? Uh, biggest thing is I just want to thank all the fans for being there all the years and that stuff, man. I really appreciate it because, you know, without you guys, you know, just a big person out there and that stuff, you know. But with all you guys, you may help make me uh, the warlord you know, one half of the powers of pain in that with along with the barbarian. And uh, it's very much appreciated by us. Um, as far as the merchandise guys, we've got uh Epic toys coming out. We got uh barbarian and me are going to be together in a, in a new series coming out. We're also going to be a nostalgic uh, figures coming out in the future. Um, we're got some bobbleheads coming out not too long. Um, Cause I know uh demolition just got them and we're going to be getting them not too long, maybe the end of the year. Um, also, there's going to be a video game. I can't remember the name of it over there, but that's going to be coming out sometime next year. Uh, they're making it in Scotland over there. So there's there's a bunch of little bunch of different things. We got uh, Wrestling Buddies that just came out through uh, the Brothers Gatter um, over here in the States. That are, I love them. They did a great job on those. So, yeah, we got a whole bunch of things coming out. Yeah, and it's great in the 2020s as well that, you know, guys who are wrestling the WWF in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, there's this all new revenue stream coming in with all the merch and all the dolls and all the new games, indie games, and all the conventions as well, of course. So, it's you know, it's a great yeah. thing. Yes, it is. Nice one. Thank you so much for being with me for two hours. It's much appreciated. I've probably got a part two in here for all the questions I scrubbed out. And thank you so much for uh, being with us, and we'll catch you again next time. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate it, man.